Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to get into this. This episode does not suck. We cover quite a few topics. But before we get into it on the business side of the house, this episode is brought to you by Templar Medical. And I actually can't think of a better fit given today's guest and the topics that we are discussing. We talk a lot about violence. And the reality is, the hard and fast reality is, that there will always be people who are adverse to violence. And that's okay, because to me, it's not about being a gut fighter or a lead slinger, however you want to define it. What you need to be is a value add. Some people are capable of causing damage, but everybody needs to be capable and have the skills to provide medical care, even those of you who are very capable of causing damage. Enter, 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 Templar Medical, which is a veteran-owned organization located in Virginia Beach, Virginia. They are an NAEMT authorized training center. They provide private and open enrollment training opportunities for civilians, law enforcement, medical personnel, and the military following to the COT triple C procedures and approved adjuncts, which are TQS. Specifically, what I want to talk to you about is one of their products. And this product is actually in my vehicle and on my gun belt. It is a med kit. And this particular medical kit is in partnership with North American Rescue, an awesome organization when it comes to in the field medicine. It's going to come in a vacuum seal bag, and it is essentially a individual I don't want to see a one-time, it is a one-time use, but it's for individuals on scene, and it's full of combat gauze, some chest seals, compression gauze or compressed gauze, ace bandages, nasal pharyngeal, and probably one of the most important things, gloves. Because before you touch anybody who is bleeding, I cannot stress enough the need to protect yourself. I don't care what it is that you believe in or don't believe in, bloodborne pathogen and virus, it's very, very real. I love these kits. I carry them with me, like I said, in my car. I, I think I'm at almost a half a dozen incidents at this point in my life where I have come up and have been in a situation where I needed to be a first responder. I grabbed a kit, ripped it open, gloved up, and went to work. And like I said, I have one on my pistol belt because there is a bag that they come in and then the med kit refill that is inside of it. The bag couldn't be easier. It has basically a woven system that holds it together. You pull a handle made out of easy to grip beads, whether or not you're in a glove, you have just your skin of your hands, whether you're hot, cold, sweaty, blood on your hands, whatever it may be, one time pull, it comes out and the medical kit is right there for you. I cannot stress enough how important it is to be a value add. The difference between somebody living or dying could potentially rest in your hands. And that is something that you should take very seriously. Another thing to consider, sometimes one kit is not enough. Like I said, I have multiple in my car and one on me on my gun belt. That is a minimum starting point. What I recommend you do, what I want you to do, is to go to templarmedicaltraining.com. And Templar is spelled T-E-M-P-L-A-R. And then medical training, all smashed together, normal spelling for those two words. And check out their site. I highly recommend you check out their MC Med Kit. Put them in your car, put them in your purse, put them on your gun belt, put them wherever you think they would be easy to access so you can be a value add regardless of the situation around you. And they are going to give you 15% off for customers who use the code CLEAREDHOT15. Now, the way I'm looking at this, it's capital C, capital H, and then the numbers 15, but that's all smashed into one word. CLEAREDHOT15, TemplarMedicalTraining.com. Check them out. This episode is also brought to you by BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, as in papa. For those of you out there listening, if there is something that is interfering with your happiness or perhaps preventing you from achieving your goals, like I think we all have, I have experienced multiple times in my life where both of those things have happened, something preventing my happen happiness and from achieving my goals. Spoiler alert, it was me both times. But what I needed was I needed some assistance from an outside party. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. 
This is not a crisis line, and it is not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There are a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas, and the service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor, and you're going to get a timely and thoughtful response, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So you won't ever have to sit in a waiting room if that makes you uncomfortable. And actually, this is what I do. I do a video call every week, and some people have said to me they don't see how it could be helpful. All I can tell you from my own personal experience is it works, or it works for me. And I was worried about the efficacy of a video call, and now it doesn't bother me at all. There's really no difference between in-person or staring at a screen. The result is the same for me. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if you need to. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. And you know what? You deserve to. So you can visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily, and that's betterhelp.com slash reviews. Or you can visit betterhelp.com slash cleared hot. That is better help hotel echo Lima Papa and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using better help that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 States for the podcast listeners. You're going to get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash cleared hot. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped. Yes. Gentlemen, 2020 has been a shit show, also known as a dumpster fire. And for some of us, it has been harder to stay as hygienic as we should be. Luckily, our partners at Manscaped have made it easy. If you have a bathroom, you have a dong salon. You know what I'm talking about? You can craft your shaft, whatever makes sense, whatever calls you. You got your choices. You have your own personal workspace. Manscaped is on a mission to change the grooming game with their below-the-waist grooming and hygiene products, and they just released their products in the UK, Canada, and Australia. The Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer offers a replaceable ceramic blade with advanced skin-safe technology, which helps reduce grooming accidents because it's tough to put a tourniquet on your shaft. The waterproof technology also allows you to groom in the shower And for up to 90 minutes, which if you're at this for 90 minutes, I want you to uh, listen to the ad before this one and find yourself some professional help. They've also just released their Shears 2.0 nail kit, which is the perfect add-on to the Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer. And what I will say is Christmas season's right around the corner. Their perfect package comes with two free gifts and other liquid formulations to complete your ball trimming routine. All of these formulations, they're vegan, cruelty-free, dye-free, sulfate-free, paraben-free, so you know that your disco stick is in good hands. You're probably sitting on the couch with your hand on your balls anyway, so you might as well keep them smelling fresh with a crop preserver, which is a ball deodorant. If you didn't think that was a thing, it is a thing. It's an anti-chafing ball deodorant designed to defend against below-the-waist odors. When the summer humidity hits, you can use this to keep your balls from sticking to your leg. They even have a crop reliever, which is a ball toner. It's a spray-on toner for your testicles. Try it out. Get in there. Explore the space. And to finish it out, they have a foot duster, which is a foot deodorant so good it can even reduce the odor of the dirtiest feet. Use the code CLEAREDHOT, all one word, and you're going to get 20% off in free shipping at manscaped.com. Basically, what I'm saying is if you love your package, If you love the cock and balls, all you have to do is go to their site, hit a few buttons on your phone, and you're going to change your life for the better. Surprise somebody. Explore the space. Don't tell them what's going on. Just let them unwrap your latest creation. 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with the code CLEAREDHOP. Update and upgrade that dong salon with the luxury products of Manscaped. And that's it for today on the business side of the house. Let's talk about my guest. It's Mike Glover. Does he need an introduction? No, not really. This man is the man. Met him for the first time when we recorded our previous episode, which the feedback from our first meeting was overwhelming. He is an ex-army 
Green Beret, also known as Special Forces. He then was a CIA contractor. What? And then, of course, got out and started Fieldcraft Survival. I We talked for three and a half hours. I'm not even going to try to explain what we talked about. All I can say is I am looking forward to round three. So let's get into round two. Episode number 147 with the man himself, Mike Glover. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Roger. Gun run. North and south. West of the smoke. West of the smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Captain, cleared hot. Thank God for YouTube. Oh fuck. Thank God for YouTube and Google, right? Yeah. I spent hours. First, uh, The first thing, of course, I Googled was, what does Joe Rogan have in his studio? Yeah. And there is five web pages dedicated oh, to yeah. completely that. All the details, too. So I was just cha-chink, cha-chink, cha-chink. And then I also, I'm going to be honest, I have a slight advantage. I just got a hold of Jamie, his producer, and said, hey, awesome. what do I need to do? And he Give me just, a list. He wrote me out a list. I was like, yeah, roger that. I'm like, and beware. If you send me some crazy shit, I'm going to buy some crazy shit. Oh, so yeah. please just give me the bare essentials. I don't need the Millennium Falcon like you guys have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck, man. Dude, this I this is cool because it ties into this badass wood table. Which is made from wood in Montana with a dude that I do jujitsu oh with who like fully crafted it. The guy cut down trees at my house where we did the first podcast. Yeah, yeah. Put this whole thing together and like the legs of it have got some metal. Um, that his buddy did. It's awesome. So this is from your property. The wood is not from my property, but the guy. I wish. I think. Yeah. I don't know shit about wood, but I think you have to let it season for yeah, a oh, season yeah, yeah. or two. Yeah. So this is older, but like the living, he killed it. It's awesome, and I just love the craftsmanship and artisanship of some of the people up here. I love it, man. It's unbelievable. I love it. I just did a post on a cowboy hat that I got from Billings, Montana. I saw it. What? So awesome. Wasn't man. it like 20 years old, the hat that was the... Yeah, the, the hat I was actually holding was a charcoal color, but it was 21 years old and patinaed. Like, it doesn't even look like that when you buy it new. It, it looks gray. But that hat looked like it was brand new almost. Yeah. The the condition of it after 21 years of like ranch <laughs> living, I'm like, damn, I need three of them. I didn't get three because they're like a thousand a piece, but I got one. Yeah. And then I was looking, the only thing I think I deviated from with Joe was the arms holding the microphones because you often see them coming up and angling down. I don't like down. that. Yeah. I like this because it's straight across. We can see each yeah. other and there's no, I've had four people in here before and there's no, there's no issue with looking across and making eye contact. I hate yeah. that. Uh, the j- shit in your face. Yeah. I don't like that either, man. Yeah. So it was low. Um, uh, yeah. Other than that, I basically just spent a lot of time on the internet and amazon.com. I like it. Are you have these mics? Are these headphones hooked up into a filter? They, okay. So it goes down through the table. Yeah. <clears throat> have you ever heard um, measure twice, cut once? Yes. Okay. So we oh God, don't tell me. drilled the holes for these <laughs> yeah. directly into the metal beams that are supporting the table because we didn't measure. We eyeballed it, which is why they have these little, you know, little plug there in between. <laughs> nice. The extension cable. <laughs> yeah. So Cameron, uh, he was just like, fuck me. I just made this table. And the first thing we did was drill a hole in the wrong place. <laughs> Which is like a new car, right? You might as well, you need to like, oh. what you need to do with a new car is flip your knife open and like chip the paint somewhere so yeah. you can calm down. Because it's going like, to happen. Let's get it over. Let's yeah. get it over with. So within this table being in this room for 20 minutes, we had drilled two holes in the wrong place, <laughs> which he plugged amazingly. So everything goes down and then around behind you and it goes through, our headphones are on, uh, it's probably behind the chair. You might not be able to see it. Yeah. But the mics and stuff all goes into a, I don't know what to call it anymore. It's the headphones. It's just a boost. Yeah. Um, and then everything else, you know, you have to have that interface between the digital signal and the computer, which is the red box underneath. And then I just, we're recording live. I use Audition because I don't know much about anything and I find it to be the easiest program to use. And Damn, this make, this makes my setup look ghetto. <laughs> like I got my cell phone turned around and just like record, disable. I, I'm not doing that, but I'm doing. Dude, when I started yeah, the, the same thing, I had a little mic with a little pop filter and a zoom, and then I went from that to the Rodecaster, which we were using last time. And yeah. finally, I was like, you know what? I have nothing else to do during this COVID time period. You might as well. I'm gonna try. Stuff. I'm gonna try. This is like your Firebase. You're just upgrading. Well, there's one thing that's left that's coming, and that is the Guinness kegerator. Ooh. And I think I'm going to have Cameron drill one more hole, 
and I think I'm going to put the tap directly there in the That center. would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know of any other podcast studio that has an actual <laughs> alcohol dispensing device in on the, the table? table? Yeah, so you people, don't have to get up? No, I want to make sure that everybody, it's got to be ergonomic, right? Everybody yeah. needs to have the chance to reach it. So we'll just go with uh, <laughs> Guinness coming directly out of the table. Are, do you get sponsored by Guinness? No, no, I'm a, it's a reverse sponsorship. I think I turned the lights <laughs> on and off with them. It's oh man, it's delightful. It's like an uh, an ice cream in a can. I, I I love well. First of all, I love Kalispell and Whitefish, like this area. Yeah, dude, it's such such an amazing. It's like for me, it's like it literally feels like therapy. I feel yeah. you know how you, like you're in um, you're in Bagram. And you're around a whole bunch of shit. Which then, doesn't feel like therapy. It, yeah, it doesn't at all. <laughs> you feel like overwhelmed. And then you get to the fire base and everything's quiet. That's how I feel. Like the, the helicopter yeah. just dropped me off. I'm like, thank God I'm home. And it feels like that here, man. I love it here. I love it. Unfortunately, well, obviously you got to see it once without this ridiculous smoke. This smoke just showed up yesterday. I saw that. I was in uh, Bozeman. I looked it up last night. What is that smoke from? I think I think we still have a westerly wind, so I believe it's blowing in from the western states. Wow, man, those it, guys are being—they're getting oh, man. crushed. It's and the insane. thing is, with this valley, it's the people will talk about it like, "Oh, the valley's a bubble," and they're talking about like socioeconomic stuff, yeah. which is true. Yeah, but it's also a weather bubble because there's mountains on the west side and on the east side. So this stuff, if there's a high pressure. The smoke just gets smashed in here. It'll be yeah. like this for a few days. It was hot as hell yesterday here. It was it was like, the, it'll be like that again today. I couldn't believe it. I was. Yeah. It was hotter. It was actually hotter here than it was Bozeman and then Utah, where I dro drove from. And I was like, "How does that work? Like, how does how does that work? Get where it's hotter here in this little pocket than it is anywhere else?" I have no and idea. I went further. I'm like near Canada. We're we're near Canada, right? We are sixty miles as the crow flies from wow. Canada. Wow. But they won't let us in right now. Yeah, because really. The invisible enemy is shutting. Do the they lock the gates? <laughs> I mean, I'm. Sh I think they have commerce going back and forth. Yeah, but you just can't go over and. I don't think you can go. Yeah, you know, basically kick around for tourism. That's so dumb. It's the invisible threat. I yeah. saw the. Stay vigilant, Mike. I saw the Twitter. <laughs> uh, the CDC. Do you see that yet? The the CDC dropped a. I can't keep track of the number of times that the CDC is going back and oh, forth. They said, well, they said a smoke, a mask is not going to help you from, oh, from I did smoke see inhalation. This. And I'm like, how does that work? And there's dudes justifying, they're saying, they're talking about droplets of water. I'm like, the droplets of water is the virus and measured in nanometers. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about literal drops of water. They're talking about droplets of saliva, which is 99, I think 0.4% of uh, Yeah, like aerosolized droplets. Yeah, it's droplets. And so they're like, it's not going to protect you from smoke particles or particulates, but it will protect you from COVID. And everybody was like, <laughs> what? And that po that tweet doesn't have a lot of uh, interaction or engagement. It's straight from CDC. What's up with that? I mean, <clears throat> let's be honest. If <sighs> that implies that everybody is dishonest. <laughs> I mean, so I did a, I did a couple podcasts with Brian Bishop, a buddy of mine, Marine Corps, and it, and it, it inflamed the internet to a degree because we were chatting about masks. Mm -hmm. My thing is, if masks, if it really, if it was incredibly important, they would tell you what type to wear. They wouldn't say it could be a t-shirt or a scarf or a sock over your face. Handkerchief. Or, correct. Mm -hmm. It's like, come on, they either, they either matter or they don't matter. True. So what yeah. is actually going on here? Yeah. It gives me, gives me pause to think. Yeah. Well, you remember when it originally came out, everything was it's not all the experts came out and they're like it's not going to work masks don't work and i was actually like but wait a minute like the nurses wear masks i know what in 95 masks do like why would you even put that out and then i was, yeah. I was like well, that's wait a minute and then all of a sudden masks were the thing and then all those experts recanted their statements and i'm like dude what is going on now and i you know it's a supply and demand issue maybe and i buy into that maybe but the fact that, uh, but we're the fact still that a handkerchief it. is going to be called a mask or a skiing buff over your neck or people just tying yeah. t shirts around their yeah. face, it's like, come on, that's, yeah. you can't tell me that that all works effectively the same way. I had a lady sit next to me, and I, I, I have a deviated septum on my right side, you probably do too, from getting smashed in the face so many times, and or the, shooting Carl Gustafs until your nose bleeds. Oh, yeah, I love that, <laughs> I deal with that <laughs> routinely. So, this, this lady was next to me, and I couldn't breathe, and I kept pulling down my mask just so I could breathe through my nose and take a breath in my mouth and put it back over on the plane. And she's like, you need to get what I got. And so she pulls out her mask and it looks like a pair of 
lace, like it looks like panties. And it's the lace portion of like, I guess, stocking or panties. It, this, what you're describing may have started its life as panties. It, it literally could have been panties. <laughs> like she could have pulled them out of her pants. But she goes, use this. And I'm like, but that's not even, she goes, nobody matter. It doesn't matter. They don't even say anything. I'm like, I'm just going to do that. I'm going to make a mask out of like a fishing net. This, yeah. <laughs> the big fishing net. <laughs> yeah. the, your nose like, no, sticks it's through a mask. it. It's a mask, man. Yeah. And then there's, I'm listening to the, well, we're canceling Halloween. It's like, that's the one day where you wear a mask. Yeah. And for kids, <laughs> it, it, do it for the children. I mean, at least for the kids. I actually spent far too long uh, on the internet trying to find a stormtrooper mask. Yeah. That I was going to wear into like grocery stores just to mock. Oh, yeah. And I'm not mocking people dying, everybody. Calm the fuck down. I am want to have fun with the shit sandwich that we're all eating. So why can't I wear a stormtrooper mask? Yeah. And people like, you have to wear a mask. And I'm like, obviously I am. Yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna wear a full <laughs> suit, a suit, a cape. <laughs> Capes are the barriers between us and COVID. It's, it's pretty crazy, man. Oh, God. You're a stat guy, too. You saw the... Was it 6%? I don't know if I'd call myself a stat guy, but I love hard science you love, what, and math. You love facts. I like facts, yeah. math, hard science, statistics. I did, you know what's funny is um, talking to you about that and then even listening to Joe and you guys, it's it's interesting because I've always been that kind of guy, Yeah. but on a big stage you guys are doing that, and that's important because so many people hypothesize, and I've seen you check people, with stats i even think in my head i'm like i can't bring some some grimy shit i can't show up like (laughs) like hypotheticals man i need to have some analytics behind what i'm talking about i like that though i'm all about hypotheticals as long as the conversation is framed around this being hypothetical we can work Mm. our way through these ideas i love the economy and commerce of ideas but i also think as an individual like if i sit down and have a conversation with somebody i feel like i need to have an understanding of where my position comes from yeah and it's okay if your position comes from emotion, but just don't confuse that with your position coming from something that is based, again, in the hard science or math or fact. Yeah, especially when you're arguing it, right? You, yeah. And you're trying to convince people of it to get, hey, get on my team. At least, that's that's what I, I can't remember where I hear, heard this recently, but um, I listen to audio books like you guys on the road, and I'm just inundated with information. But there was a guy talking about... Um, uh, layers of communication. Oh, it was Tim. It was Tim Kennedy. Yeah. My buddy Tim. And he was talking about how he wants people to talk. Like, if you really want yes. to debate a point, be a good listener. Be an advocate for being a good listener because the more somebody talks, the more their story becomes, a, like, it comes unfolded. And if you're if you're faking the funk, we know this because, like, our lives in the military, everybody sees that. that it's very transparent. And you want that. So you want to debate or you want to suppress, keep talking and let's see what your true arguments are. Let's see at the root of it what you are. I love how he framed it too. He I said, know. I want stupid people to keep talking. Yeah, I, I like, know. Yes, Tim. Yes. That's so true. <laughs> we got to be big. Are you going to let me talk a lot now on this? Don't, don't you can, do that. You can say whatever you want to. I actually, I mean, the first podcast we did lit the internet ablaze. Touch. I saw that. Yeah. So I think this one will probably, yeah. probably do Are we same. on a podcast right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're going. I like how you organically just to start that, kick that off. I just hit, re- here's the thing I've learned. <clears throat> awesome conversations will happen if you don't hit record right away. What's yeah. the worst thing that could happen? Yeah. It takes up a, a megabyte on yeah. your recording device. That's true. Hit the record So this button. is it. We're on it right now. Oh, we've been on it for like 20. Oh, I love that. Man. <laughs> I love that. That's so awesome. It did. I got great feedback from that. And especially uh, with the conversation that we had about killing people. Uh, unusual. Enough, has that, I that got seems. hundreds of messages from people who, and most of them, they, they followed a similar trend. One, they were shocked that we were able to openly talk about it from that perspective. And secondly, they were thankful that we pulled the veil back on that yeah. a little bit. And it wasn't something that I had, and I actually had a few friends reach out to me and say, that's the first time you've ever opened up on that topic. And I was thinking about it. It's like, have I ever, do I intentionally avoid it? And it was, no, I just... You gotta, yeah. you gotta have the right person to have that conversation with. Absolutely, I yeah. think we uh, it, the same exact thing happened to me, where I thought about it and I said, "Oh, I've had those conversations, but with team dudes that were standing next to me at the time." Yeah, like where we were comparing notes or saying, "Hey, do you? How do you remember that night?" And it was always at an afterthought. But in hindsight, looking back at our conversation between two guys who have different experiences in that environment. 
and people are privy to that conversation, that's got to be unique. I, I, it has to be a an odd thing. I feel odd for them, <laughs> like it, like not understanding our like our mindset and not realizing that we're not as normal. Uh, which took me a while in the transition in civilian life, realizing that you may that, not yeah. think you're normal. I am the single most normal person I know. <laughs> I don't have any problems at all. No residual, no baggage. From our, That's no, what I hear. I'm totally sane. I <laughs> Those are the rumors. Yeah. I don't distrust humanity and human beings at all. I just look at everything as fucking <laughs> rainbows and gumdrops. Yeah, I'm not what you would call paranoid yeah. at all. <laughs> when you had to disarm that Claymore coming into your driveway, I was like, this is totally normal. Like that, I would have to disarm that too. Why are your trees painted different colors at 100-yard increments? <laughs> I don't know. On the I back like side to of paint. Them. Yeah. <laughs> No, it, oh. it was interesting listening to Tim on Joe's podcast. And for people who haven't listened to it, I highly recommend that they do. Like I said before we started, I'm always incredibly impressed with uh, SF, Special Forces, specifically the ability to articulate the mission set. Like the mm. way Tim broke down everything from J set to uh, the programs going over there for security, the buy with and through, all of that stuff. I think SOF, and well, I don't know if we unpacked this the last time, SF specifically, Green Beret, ODA type mm -hmm. stuff. A lot of people will just say SF and they think they're talking about All, the community. Yeah. That, for people listening, would be SOF, Special Operations Forces. I would say, in my experience, that the SF community uh, is an amazing job at explaining the mission set and that understanding. Better so, I would say, than the SEAL community, for sure, because we're more like Smash Rock, yeah. You know, or turn turn rock into pebbles, pebbles into dust. We're very yeah. good at that. I wonder why that. Well, but why is that? Um, you know, culturally, or is it is it actually like a training thing? No, but look at we were talking about this last. You know, Robin Sage. There's oh, no yeah, Robin yeah. Sage for our community. It should be. There should be, but also at the same time, your community and the community I came from, they drew slightly from different origins, and I think they That's true. They went in that direction, and it's interesting because, you know, the UDT the the predecessors of the SEAL teams, these men who had fucking balls that you needed wheelbarrows yeah. to carry Tucked around. Yeah, their UDT shorts. Yeah, their yeah. primary weapon was a slate on their arm and a lead line so they could go measure fathoms. They would just go in before amphibious invasions, covered in axle grease, which I've never covered myself in axle grease. Really? They used to do that? Dude, before- Cover themselves in axle grease. Before wetsuits, they were trying to put like a petroleum layer on for warmth. Because wow. they were rolling in. I mean, you know what UDT shorts are. Yeah, oh, yeah. The most yeah. unacceptable attire for any human being ever. Yeah. Super uncomfortable. Yeah. So they would throw that on, a uh, Jacques Cousteau dive mask, mm -hmm. and they would go out and they would survey the beaches looking for, you know, the the uh, avenues in. They would look for obstacles. They would blow obstacles. And they would do that prior to an invasion. They saw like a K-bar knife on their leg. And their whole thing is they were just measuring water. Because there's And we did this in training. They were tying knots. There's a knot tied at every fathom mark on a piece of string. Wow. And you just swim along the beach and you measure it. And you write it down on a fucking grease pencil on your arm. Wow. Those are the predecessors to the SEAL. So it came from that world, then to Vietnam, where it switched from UDT to the SEAL teams. And then I just think our pipeline, it never, like, I don't ever remember early on in our career the term FID. I remember hearing the term and I knew what it was, but it was never our primary mission set yeah. or, uh, you know, advise and assist or going with the partner force. And I think the origin, and I'm speaking from outside, obviously you can correct me, but I think the origin of SF is more in that direction. Yeah. And so I think at a, at a cultural pipeline level, it's just deeper. Mm -hmm. But the ability, I'm so impressed with Tim because the ability to articulate those things in my opinion, makes you so much better at the execution because he defined at a granular level the role. And if you can do that, you know exactly what your job is and you're going to be yeah. so much better at it overseas. Yeah, he's super intelligent. And I've, I actually was uh, with him in the same unit. We went to sniper school together and did a whole bunch of stuff. And he's always been kind of that guy. And I think you're right. Part of it is the training pipeline. Like they teach us um, MDNP, the military decision making process. They harp on planning in the five paragraph operations yep. order. We do we do even in small unit tactics where you're you're learning patrolling and all the things that you would do in the wood line. You're still having to plan this along the way. And as a I mean I went to Ranger School when I was 18 years old and operations orders, which was the scariest thing for me because patrolling is easy. Yeah, reacting to contact battle drills that's easy, but standing in front of senior NCOs that are going to Ranger School as well as a PFC, a private first class, and then having to 
uh, plan that was beat into you because it's either like you swim or you drown. And yeah. uh, I think you're right. And that kind of stuff is is harped. But I've seen some dumb SF guys. But just like some, I've seen some dumb sealed sealed dudes who look at foreign internal defense who go, I don't ever want to do that. And then I go, man. And they just fucked up by saying that because yeah. that. So yeah. Afghanistan 2010, my last tour there. It was as far away from the DA direct action. Oh, that's one thing that we have to do. Did you get a bunch of emails saying I didn't understand anything you guys were talking about because it oh, was yeah. all acronyms? Yeah. So we got to do our best we to break it. <laughs> <laughs> People are literally were like, "You asshole! Put a glossary on the podcast description." I'm like, "Sorry, man. Like we were talking about it's shit." The DA raid. Yeah. Direct action. So it would be you know you're you're literally going to a compound or a, a village and. You're trying to find, fix, and finish somebody in, in a location, essentially. Okay, so that, I think, is what most people, to include myself, wanted to do with mm-hmm. their career. But as battle spaces mature, like OIF-1 and OEF-1, DA-centric. Oh, yeah. yeah. OIF-5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, probably still DA-centric in the 6, 7, 8, 9 time period. Yeah. Beyond that, you went over the hill. Yes. And it became partner forced by, through, and with. Afghanistan, exactly the same thing. So I go back in 2010, and you know we're out at Fob Nabahar mm-hmm. with a partner force, mandatory one-to-one partner force, either ANA or ANP, and some people were really resistant to it. Like, this is stupid. You know, I don't want to do this. This isn't what I signed up for. I'm like, you're a moron. If you understand FID or the partner force, it's the key that unlocks yes. the kinetic aspect yeah. later on. That's how you get on the target. Correct. Yeah. It's yeah. like, come on, man. This is our chessboard now. Let's look at our pieces. And we had an incredibly kinetic uh, deployment because we smartly played the pieces that were in front of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think unco- unconventional warfare and uh, irregular warfare are also bred in the relationships that you build with host nation forces. Yeah. So it's all access and placement. If you're if you're involved in day to day operations, that might be training. What you're able to do is all the second, third, tertiary, you know, elements that are required in building up uh, the packet, I guess, for unconventional warfare to be able to do the advanced forward operations to prepare the battlefield. They call this operational prepare preparation of the environment (OPE), which is all the things you need to do to set that place up. Where when it falls apart, if it falls apart, which most likely it will then you're prepared to go into war. And that, that's like, that's Green Beret 101, which is foreign internal defense, is that access and placement. And I remember in 06, working with the SEALs, um, they were all young SEALs. Most of them didn't have war. Their uh, leadership did, because yep. they were there in five and, and four. Um, but they were like, ah, we don't need to do fit. I'm like, counterterrorism, foreign internal defense is the way, and the means yep. to get in the fight, trust me. And we started, they started picking up on it more. And they, I saw young guys, like 22 years old, um, take a lot of pride in teaching CQB, teaching. And then they're honing their own skill sets. Yep. Because when you teach, That's you when become, you determine how well you actually know 100%, something. 100%. You become a better <laughs> practitioner of the skill sets that you're teaching. Because you get like, asked my favorite question. People will say, why do you do this? It's like, because um, the guy who taught me told me to do it. Wrong answer. Yeah. Incorrect yeah. answer, sir. Yeah. Maybe that's a lot of people now. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, if you're an instructor and somebody asks you that and you don't know the answer, you say, shut the fuck up. This yeah. isn't question and answer time. Yeah. But that's uh, just a that's a bullshit move because then you need to go figure out what it is. Yeah. You go ask your buddies, like, what, what was this? Yeah. Hey, I just had to crush this dude real fast. Uh, tell him to shut up. Does anybody know the answer? 100%, man. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm a big fan of, of FID, always have been, but understanding its role. Because, I mean, I was that guy. Everybody who's young, and we were all that guy. Fight. We I were all kick that guy. doors and shoot people in the face. And like you can get there, man. And by the end of my career, uh, as a, even as a sergeant major and as a team sergeant, it was um, if I could facilitate the kill, which is, sounds like desperation. It kind of was. I was like, even if we can facilitate the kill, guys, and try to motivate them, they're like, facilitate. You mean like setting the parameters? Like, yeah, yeah, you know, doing the intel and the SDRs, anything we could do. And I'm like, oh, God, this sucks. But it's just the evolution of war. But it's also, I think, the long-term strategy to win. The oh, U.S. Yeah. military, yes. we can't commit everywhere that we need to. And Tim yeah. was talking about that, too. What happens if, why we're there? Stability and security. And that's one of the biggest things that I wish people would, because I hear this all the time, as I'm sure everybody does who pays attention, that 
the complaints about the foreign policy of the United States. We're mm-hmm. interventionists. We're out there, you know, and I'm basically repeating what Tim was saying. You know, we're out there policing the world, and and that's not the point, and that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to facilitate these people in the countries that they're in, policing themselves. Yeah, and that's the long term strategy because, I mean, let's just look at the special operations community. Imagine if they had to keep the op tempo for the 2000 to 2010 time period. Oof. It would grind people into dust. I don't think it's possible. Yeah, I, I don't think they can manage it. Um, I don't think they're prepared for that kind of, I don't even know what you'd call that, the the second and third order effects of that. It would crush people physically, physiologically, yeah. emotionally. Yeah. yeah. I'm broke. Je- like when I think about six, seven, and eight, even just those three years, that wore me out. I mean, that that I loved it, and we were yeah. I was super pumped and motivated about life, and we'll never get those years back. But I look back on those years, and I'm like, man, dude, we're like the the op tempo for that of like even coming back. I think I, my five rotation, I did nine months in Afghanistan, a fire base, and I came back and spent two months home, and then went straight to Iraq for for some DA stuff. Then came home, went to sniper school. Went to free fall school, and then went straight back to Iraq again. And like, I don't remember ha- living a life in my twenties. How could you? You yeah. didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, that's why I'm trying to make up for it now as an old man. But how much did you love that oh time period? Gosh, You're dude. like, oh my god. I, I, I thought I, I was nabbing out a way. I'm like, is there a way for us to live this as our lives? You know. And that is how you would be dead at 35 of adrenal failure. That's true. And yeah, just completely and utterly smoked. Yeah, yeah, and I think I remember uh, Command Sergeant Major Ferris, who was the at the time he might have been JSOC or um, SOCOM CSM, and he said, uh, "We are going to make sure we take care of the guys." And he started the red, amber, green cycle, and he's he said mandatory time home that lasted a couple months. And yeah, then he's like, "Oh, sh- the wheels fall off. Let's let's go back to war." Well, I think one of the most insidious parts of that is that the guys. If you give them the choice, they'll put the gas pedal to the floor. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think it was I was talking with Jason Silva, and he was just saying, the job always suffers last. Mm-hmm. And I saw it in myself. If, if I'm being totally honest and I look back, I, when I was overseas, stoked. And when I was home, I was thinking about overseas and what I needed to do to go back over there. And shit would fall off. Mainly, I mean, like a wheel coming off, but the lug bolts, the lug bolts were yeah. coming a little bit oh, loose. Yeah. And you just put it to the side because the job suffers last. And then what you end up with is, let's say you do 20, started at 18, you have a 38-year-old early in life, mm-hmm. early in life, a cre- incredible military accomplishments, intelligent, um, but probably physically and psychologically at the tail end of what they can tolerate. Yeah. And I don't think that's healthy for people at all. And you couldn't stop them in the middle of that because that's what they want to do. Yeah. And I don't know the solution for that. I don't think there is one. I I listened to um, you see the uh, one of the uh, special missions units, uh, uh, CAG uh, Medal of Honor, Medal of Honor, yep. Pat Payne, and you know I I see. So I knew Pat Payne when I was I was there, and Pat Payne's a rock star. It feels weird saying his name openly, but is he still in? He's still in. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. So there's there's rumors, but like Pat Payne's an 18 year guy right now. He's he's okay. a young guy. Pat Payne. Um, when we were together in uh, Afghanistan, he got enemy fragmentation. He's the kind of guy who got injured, went home uh, with another guy uh, off an objective where th- uh, 36 enemy combatants were killed. No casts, all small arms, big gunfight. Uh, two, I think two guys were wounded from, from um, getting shot, and then two guys were wounded from fragmentation. Lost a dog on that objective. He goes home for a couple of weeks and fights to get back and gets back. Yeah. You know, he's that kind of guy. Wins best ranger in, in 2012, and then um, is just a rock star. And then on this hit in 2015, you know, selflessly, he's running the bolt cutters. He's get he gets called up as I think he's a two IC. Gets called up. They're in a gunfight. The guys that are in a hallway. I think it's probably one of the teams that are in a hallway. I was actually on the CIA side of this um, uh, in Erbil at the time, and. They go to cut the bolt cutters, and they can't get through them because of the smoke inhalation. So this is a partnered force operation. It's yeah. bi- bilat or bilateral, which means you're operating with uh, uh, one unilateral American force and typically a host nation force. And the smoke inhalation is causing them to not be able to get through the chain. And all the hostages are locked behind the door. And so 
ISIS and the gunfights and everything, they're clacking off their vest. The building's on fire. Um, they're in a gunfight. The guys, I, I can't remember, I, I wouldn't say what team it was, but one of the teams was inside the hallway, and they're down to their last magazine in this gunfight. He comes, he exposes himself to gunfire, tries to unlock it, switches out with one of the Iraqi uh, partner forces. They, he can't get it. He takes a breath, comes back in again, and then unlatches it. Uh, not only do they free 70 plus hostages who most of them were Azidi uh, Christian um, uh, Iraqis, which is common to the uh, Kurdish people, they break out and they set up a human wall to shield them as they're running off the X uh, in the middle of the gunfight trying to get to the helicopters. And, it, you know, in, in the in historical terms, it is the largest hostage rescue, successful hostage rescue conducted in the modern global war on terror. Probably by a magnitude. Of oh, a huge magnitude. I mean, yeah. I've done hostage rescues where you rescued same kind of Iraqi deal, like a dozen people. But 70 I've gone on them where you're looking for a single person. Yeah, absolutely. You know? uh, the the Italian job is a, yeah. is a good one. Uh, two uh, two guys. So Not a good movie, as a total aside. Uh, yeah, not a good, <laughs> good YouTube video. Um, but um, all these guys and gals get off. They, they uh, get rescued. And... That's just like I hate to say this, but that's like a normal day. Like when you're doing a DA hit, all the technical things that are going on, the stress that you're processing, all like the literal life of an operator operator in that unit or in special operations is living their life through technical means, like an a POV perspective. And those things that are happening are just everyday routines. Except, you know, in this case, uh, uh, Pat Payne, Sergeant Major Pat Payne went above and beyond. Um, but I would argue that lots of guys in tiered units in special operations go above and beyond and are never ever recognized recognized ever. Yeah. And, and, and nothing to say because Pat Payne deserves that. Yeah. But here's what I know about Pat Payne in the context of what we were talking about originally is he's wearing that medal. Master Sergeant Josh Wheeler, who was a, a rock star in that unit, was killed tragically in a gunfight. His, I think his last words were on me because he was a TO at the time and got killed in a gunfight. Um, and when you look at the award, which is the Medal of Honor, and you look at the responsibility, he's going to bear that responsibility. He's going to take that in. But now he's no longer operational. And I know right now he's, he's, he's going back and forth with the Department of the Army, as, as he should be, to lead because he wants to lead and, and you know there's a rumor he might want to want to lead special operations units that that's the kind of leader we need in yeah. the military but those kind of guys exist all over the special operations community from ranger regiment all the way to the tier one forces and they do these kind of things every single day and none of them want valorous awards because if you get a medal of honor that's taking you out of the fight now he has to, he, he's a 30-year guy He's got 12 years where if they pull him out of the fight, he, at the prime of his career, because he's still a young dude, he's yeah. younger than us, um, wants to still be in the fight, and now he's out They're of it. They're not going to let him. Yeah. I think they did the same thing with Ed Byers. He got yeah, that MOH, that. Uh, yep. Afghanistan. It actually was a hostage rescue as well. It I was. Believe. It was. Wasn't it? It was Afghanistan, that's right. It was Afghanistan, yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, God, what would be the polite way to put this? It's too risky for the United States military or the government to lose that individual if they were to go back. They become that, yeah. uh, they become too valuable and I don't say this negatively towards the person who's receiving the award because I have nothing but respect, but I feel like to a degree they become too valuable of a chess piece and they're not willing to put them back on the board. Yeah. I feel that way too in in, in, a, in a sense. I think I, I hate to even say it this way, but I think he has a broader responsibility now. I agree with that too. And uh I I couldn't agree with your sentiment more. The number of like things that I have seen that define bravery be so far beyond like the Webster's dictionary or valorous actions that went completely and utterly unrecognized because either nobody saw it mm -hmm. or nobody said shit about it yeah. is un unbelievable. Yeah. Nobody cared because they were on to the next target. Yeah. Is, they're doing another TST. Or yeah. everybody else was doing exactly the same thing yeah. because yeah. that is, yeah, it's hard to describe. Um, I think I thought it was amazing that they recognized him for that effort. Yeah. Smoke inhalation is no joke. Oh, yeah. It's not like outside right now. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> I have only one experience with that. Uh, and this is not to draw, try to draw a comparison between the Medal of Honor story <laughs> at all. This is uh, us being dumb fuckwits in Iraq. So this is OIF-1. 
right? We are still like, we're so badass. We know everything. And then you yeah. look backwards, you're like, uh, we were really dumb. We got very, very lucky. I'm trying to figure it out. So we're rolling downtown Baghdad. I think we had borrowed CAG's uh, Panders. Or no, what are the, the special vehicles that they have? The Panders. Yeah, the yeah. Panders. So, six vehicle or six yeah. wheeled ones. I don't know where we got them, but we were <laughs> driving around in them. Sorry, CAG guys, love you to death. And, uh, <laughs> We, I remember we roll up and we like L'd the outside of a compound. Breach went off, and there was a like a bucket of either gasoline or propane, pretty proximal to the breach. So when it went off, it sprayed it everywhere. Ooh, yeah, and I have never, I've never been a firefighter, so I've never really seen a house kind of go up. But the blackness of the smoke, and of course, looking back at this. Uh, the people that we were, I don't even remember who we were after, but I can tell you right now, they didn't rise to any occasion where any of us should have gone inside of that building. Yeah. yeah. So, of course, we all ran in. Yeah. <laughs> Kicked in the doors. I'm like upstairs and it is so dark. Like I've always, or, up until this point, you hear like, well, if your house is on fire, just like, just get out. Yeah. I couldn't see shit. I was crawling on the floor to find the stairs, wow. like watching the black smoke come and breathing it into and I get down the stairs and it's the same thing. And as I run out, there is a fucking propane tank where the outside of the propane tank is on fire Ooh. that we all ran past on the way in. Great wow. situational awareness, right? Wow. So we just got out of there. And I guess, uh, you know, from the ISR platforms, they're just like, what's happening? Because it's just this cool. Dude, that's crazy. And you, I couldn't have done anything. Yeah. I, I could have, there could have been a tiger walking around in that room and I wouldn't have known it because I couldn't see anything. Yeah. So. When you were telling that story, because I didn't know the specifics, I'm like, oh my God, I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's scary too. It's super scary. I, as I, I remember going up the stairs and I made a left and I got about four steps and I literally just fell to the floor. I'm like, I have to retrace my steps now. Wow. So obviously we're outside like head Nods, count. lasers? Oh, everything. Oh, so you're blacked out. You oh, dude, it was yeah. done. Yeah. And we get back out and of course the only thing we need is a head count because we're getting the fuck out of there. Yeah. But that was, that was one of the most bizarre experiences that I ever had. It's the only time I went into a building like that. But yeah, yeah I can only under, only imagine trying to go and take a breath to run back inside to try to get people out. Yeah, that's how uh, Ambassador Stevens was killed. Really? Smoke inhalation. So when, when we, I, I deployed in October to Libya, uh, the State Department now was big on looking at the circumstance. They were finally paying attention. And we hit the ground and we were looking at crisis action plans and hey how can we mitigate this and one of the ways we we one of the tactics they used was the tires they would set they were throwing the which tires which is the most horrendous smoke ever oh my gosh oh. yeah cuz if you it, i'm not, i've seen it all i've seen it in yemen i've ran over tires they're trying to burn in front of us at checkpoints but it's common in the middle east and africa and they lit the tires on fire and pushed them through the slats in the uh, in the compound walls that there were bars, so you couldn't. Oh, get, they wedged them. They wedged them through there and then set them on fire and basically, you know, willed the tires inside. But that smoke inhalation is is what cost uh, Ambassador Stevens his life. And you know, uh, unbeknownst to the popularity of the, all the circulation of bullshit about him being, you know, uh, raped and br mutilated, don't, none of that's true. He he died of smoke inhalation. Uh, in fact, the picture that you see of him being pulled out, people would think those are the terrorists. Those are actually good people trying to that trying out. to help him. Um, you know, inherently the the Libyan people are actually super friendly, but AQAP, uh, rem, you know, remnants of of terrorist organizations coming in there yeah. and try to occupy that that um, that vacuum that was left behind. But they were trying to help him, and then he was evacuated, and he died of smoke inhalation. And man. I, I can't. That that's scary, man. That's well, you another, can see it in that yeah. picture. He's so ashen and oh, discolored. Yeah. yeah. I think I. I mean, I would imagine if I had stayed standing, I probably a couple good breaths of that probably would have gone out. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you lose. And the and the thing is, that's what happens. You lose consciousness, and then you're stuck in it. And then you're stuck in it. And then yeah. you're breathing it. And then basically your oxygen levels go to nothing, and yeah. then you just pass away. You you go to sleep, and you never wake up again. No um, thanks. Yeah. No. <laughs> Hot tip to people. Hot tip. If you see a propane tank that is burning on the outside, <laughs> maximize your distance from that propane tank. Yeah. Well, the thing, the, the thing too, people like with special operations, 
the reeds, palm trees, and smoke of any kind, you can't see through night vision and lasers. You get your lights. Your infrared light will not cut through that. Actually, if you turn it on, you're going to see less. Yeah, you'll it's see less. Like, it just blinds yeah. you. And then white light does the same thing. So you're yeah. blind. You're you're just and you're just in darkness as well. Yeah, you get about fifty thousand dollars worth of gear on you, and it doesn't work. It's all useless. <laughs> it's crazy, man. OIF one, man. I wish I got some of that. I was um, at the time. You know, it would have been underwhelming for you looking back in your career. It just there. I mean, it was kind of like a smash complete and overwhelming fire pierce superiority technological superiority and it wasn't until later where that vacuum was created and then people started coming to get their jihad on yeah and that's that, what i hear that was later oif1 was uh i think it's the uncertainty that would entertain me oh for sure yeah you the, guys are going in there and you have you're like this is like what's going to happen my first real world target ever was the number one chem bio target in iraq we were looking at it mm. before we went Mop level four, there's which is mission oriented protective posture. Yeah, I don't know how to describe to people what it feels like to wear it, Miserable. other than put a garbage bag over your face. Mm -hmm. um, actually, yeah, ventilator recirc or I did. Called? Okay, I had a, I had a re -bre re -bre it wasn't a re -bre it was a ventilator I think, which oh, yeah. is basically so gas masks traditionally will have one canister, a scrubber canister that has a certain amount of life. But we had a hose that went to our back that had two canisters and it was a battery powered blower essentially. But I just put my weapon sling over the hose, which was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but other, yeah, so mop level four is the highest level of protective posture. Just imagine wearing garbage bags underneath a firefighter set of turnouts with a set of garbage bags over the top. In a sauna. In, in a sauna. Yeah. And you're on a assault bike doing calisthenics. And at a minute out. First real world target ever. Door gunner shot in the face right in front of me. So that I was like, wow. holy fuck. You find it in the 60s in the image? 47s. Ooh. Four hour. Even worse. Four hour flight. You can't see anything. Oh, no. So we left from RR and a flight of, I believe it was four 47s and four 60s. They sent a C-130 with little birds in it to do a desert landing strip. Ooh. They landed, pulled the little birds out, joined us in flight with the snipers on it. Whoa. For the first, yeah. So it was amazing, right? Whoa. Flexing a little bit of fire superiority. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that goes down. Um, I think I was on the second 47. There's like 10 rounds or so into the first one, 27 rounds. And not a single person uh, other than the door gunner, obviously. He lived. I don't think he was the same afterwards because it kind of peeled off the back of his head. But I didn't realize how ridiculous it was until the next morning. We got back, woke up, walked out to see the helicopters, and they're just stitched wow. with bullet holes. And this holes. is a nighttime hit. It was a nighttime hit. Wow. It was um the first in the first hours of OIF1. Damn. Yeah. Successful hit. Uh define successful. Dry hole was it? 100% dry hole. Yeah. <laughs> the number one chem bio target in Iraq was an agricultural school. Really? Yeah. I've hit some of those. I ripped off all of my mask and shit as soon as I started seeing textbooks. I'm like, I don't care. I'd rather die of sarin gas than suffocate. I just started- They were in the textbooks. Did you look in the textbooks? I just saw a tomato on it, but I'm like, <laughs> fuck me, man. So oh. yeah, that was number one. Jessica Lynch was number two. And then- That's from, a big one, yeah. It was, uh, that was blown out of proportion, you know? And again, it you talk about, you know, the ambassador in Libya, a lot of the people around her, they were trying to do the right thing. They were trying to get her back to American forces. They put her in an ambulance. They tried to get her back to a checkpoint. She ended up getting – the ambulance got shot at because, well, insurgents were – not even insurgents. It was the Fedayeen at that time. Yeah, yeah. They were using ambulances to move around. As and their cover. As their cover. So they just picked something that in the days before that, you know what I mean? Now the Americans are conditioned to getting shot at, so they're shooting at it from a – like a long distance, like, hey, you need to stop and get out yeah, of here. Yeah, yeah. But – you know, we, we saw no uh, resistance on target. She was being cared for by doctors. It was cool to get her out of there, but it was definitely blown out of proportion. Yeah. One of the coolest things about this podcast is I sat down and I talked with her about it for That's two That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, she people had, need to listen to that. She had never sat down and had a conversation with somebody on the other side. Were you? Was it an in-person interview? Yeah. What was that like? It was surreal because I didn't go into the room with her. Uh, my team leader and one of the PJs were the ones in there that were providing medical care. And after she left, we stayed for hours because we we're going to find the bad guys. Yeah. They'd already left. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, we're going to move along. So um, and then we moved on to the next. And then and we so we were in Baghdad 
I don't know, maybe 48, 72 hours after that. And it was every night, essentially, you know, dusk until dawn, just banging targets, some good, some bad, dry holes, figuring out the intelligence cycle. Because at that point, we were pushing so hard that essentially they were fleeing. Yeah, yeah. So there wasn't a lot of resistance. But to be able to go back and sit down and talk about it from her perspective and what she experienced. And I wouldn't want to put words in her mouth, but I personally believe she was used as a huge chess piece, Yeah. right? I remember when it first came out that she was rescued, I remember hearing on the news, Jessica Lynch fought to her last round, should be the first female Medal of Honor recipient. And then you look and she, she never even had a chance to. She yeah. tried, she got knocked unconscious, weapon jammed. It's like, what's like, stop using these people as fucking chess pieces. I know, man. Disgusting. It's not fair to them. It's not. It's not fair to them. And she was a truck driver, like an 88 Mike, I think, right? I think she was in the back of a non armored Humvee. I think they hit a truck. Mm. I believe they, I believe they hit a semi. Mm. But yeah, it was a total shit she show. She was in a big convoy. She was in a big, well, she was supposed to be in a big, big convoy. But there was a uh, breaking contact. They, yeah, well, and they weren't under contact, but they they were visibly separated. Took a wrong turn, Ooh. and ended up downtown Nazaria. In the early days, yeah. where Fedahim was running around yeah. like fuckwits. Is it? Didn't Fedahim? I can't even say that. Fedahim. Is that right? <laughs> Feta? Fedahim. I don't know. Let's fuck call him Feta. How about fuck those people? Yeah. Didn't they become <laughs> the leadership of ISIS? Somebody was just recently telling me that. I lost control of the Hydra snake, you know, because it started in Afghanistan, right? Taliban. And in Iraq, we were fighting the Iraqi military. And then it morphed to Al-Qaeda. Yep. And then I started hearing about ISIS and then ISIL. And I lost, I kind of lost control or an understanding of where the Hydra began. Mm. I could see it. Somebody was telling me that the FEDA were rolled up and a lot of them were put into Guantanamo. And then- Later, this is later, uh, it, not Guantanamo, Gitmo. That Git, is Guantanamo. Wait, wait, which one's the one? Not, Gitmo is Guantanamo. No, which uh, one's the one in Iraq? Uh, God damn it. Where they had the people, yeah. the, like pyramids and shit. We cleared that prison. Yeah. Um, it was. I did one hit on it too. God damn it. Did you go into the room that was full of macaroni? No. There Fuck. was macaroni in there? Bro. Like the whole room was full of macaroni. Bro. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> <What>? <laughs> we're clearing this hospital. We're in like an outlying section and go running into a room into like I take a step in and it goes like all the way to my waist to fucking macaroni noodles. Dry noodles. Yes. I don't know why. What? I don't know what the fuck they were there for, but I just backed out and went to the next room because I assumed there was nothing bad <laughs> in a room full of macaroni noodles. Abu Ghraib. Abu Ghraib. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. But you never saw the macaroni room because that's the VIP tour. Does this exist, the mac room? Dude, I'm can assuming- Can you confirm this story? With, is there somebody else who- Where's your number two guy at? I might have been the number two guy. <laughs> it was so fucking bizarre and non sequitur to what was going on. Nobody like, talked about it. <laughs> I was just like, "Is this is happening? Okay, I'm going to the next room. <laughs> I'm sure it's been cleaned out by now, but that fucking memory sticks with me. Because That's it crazy. makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, that place is kind of weird. I, but that I was, didn't, yeah. yeah, that was a bougarib, which turned Abu into Grib, a yeah. literal and figurative shit show. It, it did, and that that whole thing was a debacle. And I, what I heard is those guys got put there, and this is after all the controversy with American forces that they got broken out in two thousand. I'm assuming thirteen, right before all the shit went down, and became the primary leadership. Which is kind of crazy if you think about like the beginning, the origin story of where they were at, which yeah. is we roll into Iraq and we don't just say, which I think is a bad strategic decision, where we say, hey, everybody who's in the military, you're all enemy combatants now. We're going after you. Like that's probably dumb, especially because if you, if you actually talk to the generals, which they have a pretty good hierarchy uh, in, in their chain of command, and you say, hey, generals. We are going to take all these guys, and we are going to give you the opportunity to make this the Iraqi army, and and work with them some way instead of going. You're all fucking on the deck, you know. You're all enemy combatants, yeah. which I think is a bad move um, and caused a lot of issues. And that evolved itself and progressed itself into ISIS. It's fucking insane. I could see them becoming the leadership if they were all slammed into a Bugarab together, mm -hmm. just like I would imagine happened at uh, Gitmo. I, I would imagine to get. Uh, placed in Gitma, you probably have to be 
a touch more extreme or radical in oh, your yeah. beliefs. I have yeah. no idea. That's a complete assumption on my part. But I can only imagine that people at Gitmo are becoming more radicalized, not less. Yeah. So if you smash these people together, the Fedayeen people together, I could see them thinking, plotting. thinking, plotting, idle time, think, you know, discussing what we're going to do and then get out and poof. Yeah. How come nobody's talking about the fact that Trump did crush? I mean, Trump didn't crush, but, but as under the commander in chief, yeah. launching special operations, which I think was the best, one of the best tactics in modern military history. And and the fact you don't hear a lot about it, except for, you know, even recently, 2015, that hit was early on in the fight against ISIS. But the Syrian fight in Aleppo, where we lost dudes from fifth group, we lost dudes from the unit, we, we lost dudes from all over, and we crushed them. I mean, annihilated them off the face of the planet. Never is talked about. I think it's because people are unable or unwilling to separate Trump as a person between Trump as the commander in chief. Yeah, true. I, I think, and I don't know if that's a, a just a mental gap that they no. can't cross. Yeah. And I, and I say that based just off of what I see, hear, and read. Yeah. On social media, it almost doesn't matter. All human beings have their flaws, and trust me, I have some pretty severe issues with the way that Trump conducts himself. But I have no problem admitting uh, where those issues are, and also saying, you know what, you fucking kicked ass on this particular issue. But I think that requires a little bit of nuance. And then you start to blend the ideologies of the left and the right. And you're like, oh, no, I land in the middle. Mm. Is this, you know what I mean? And yeah. I don't think people like that. Yeah. That's what I see, at least. It's either you are here and with us or you are over here and you are against us. And there's almost no gap in between. I hate that divisiveness. That's, that's, that's really, it's convenient. It's the easy way to go, right? You could just say, hey, you're on the other side of the team. I'm going to draw the line in the sand. This is easy for me because I'll just assimilate with my friends. Uh, and most of those friends are virtual friends on social media versus coming to some commonality, which you don't have to now. I mean, you don't have to talk to your neighbor. You don't even have to look at people. You could probably yeah. work and do a job for the rest of your life and career never even interacting with human beings, um, especially now with all the COVID shit going on. It's it's interesting. Well, and then to go back to, again, Tim, on you know Joe's show talking about if you choose to do that or you're forced to do that and you curate the information that you are absorbing – and it's only from what you agree with. And you don't have that ecosystem of ideas and ideologies that can bounce up against. Mm -hmm. well, that's one of my favorite things is to see or read something and like it bounces up against what I believe. I'm like, huh. Didn't you have somebody from the Black Lives Matter movement? Or I saw you had something. It wasn't. Deal. It was. I, I mean, I don't know. I would have to let her. Uh, her name was Francine or Samantha Francine. Yeah. I don't know where she would put herself in uh, perspective to the actual Black Lives Movement organization, but she was here in Whitefish, and uh, it was brought to my attention because there's this towering white dude just trying to scream her down, and she is standing her ground, weight on her toes, just eye to eye with this. I was like, fuck yes. Like, I want to hear about your life. I want to hear what led you to that point where you stood up to that person mm -hmm. as opposed to backing away. And some people lost their mind. How could you have this person on who supports Black Lives Matter? I'm like, that's what you want to do. You want to hear their perspective. And not even that. It's like, I want to, I want to talk about the woman. And if she talks about things that she believes in or she brings up Black Lives Matter, I'm going to listen. That doesn't mean that I agree, but I'm going to listen and think about it and hopefully refine my position in the world and what I think. Yeah. I, I Look, my whole thing on this, on the BLM thing especially, is if you have a rational, um, if you have a rational idea, and that idea is to progress your ethnic group, religious group, whatever group you belong to, and you, you want to line that plan out, and you want to talk about it, and you're not hurting anybody, I'm all on board that. And even as even as a movement, the problem that people, a lot of people, especially on the far right, don't realize is it's so decentralized. It, it completely and utterly. By design. By design. Because the benefit is you don't have to take credit for the things that are bad, but you could take credit for all the good. And you don't have to be associated with the violence. You could say, we don't support any violence. And then violence continues to happen, and it just, it is what it is. Right? Yeah, they sit there and they try and to wash their they hands. They wash their hands clean. Yep. So it, it's beneficial in operating decentralized in all means of task organizations. I mean, it, it's, it's just how it works. So people don't realize that people inherently are flawed, 
I mean, that's just that is that is the start point, right? If we understand that, and then looking at this argument, when you look at people that are involved in this organization, most of them, I would say, most of them, the majority of them, don't know what they're involved in. They don't know uh, the Marxist ideology tied to the root of the founders. It, that's that's illustrated on their about us on their website. They don't understand the end state and goals or objectives. They just want to be part of something. So when I see a this happened in Prescott, Arizona, which is, you know, my, my company, e, e, we're still in Prescott, Arizona, but we evolved and we uh, stood up a, 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 I'll call it a shop, a Ford operating base. I was going to say, I'm going to call it a fob. <laughs> it's a fob. <laughs> we're fobbits now in, in Hebrew City, Utah. How dare you, fobbits. fobbits. Fobbits are a real thing. People don't believe it. Is, but I'm outside the wire now. I'm, I'm outside the wire now. Um, so I see that taking place and, and there's a Prescott, Arizona BLM protest. And if you go to Prescott, Arizona, the median age is 62 years old. Yeah. It's a retirement community. And it's a beautiful place, though. Beautiful I used, place. I used to fly in there all the time. I love that tons place. Of, tons of really good people who are just Americans who want to live their life in peace. No drama. And there are a lot of veterans. There's a, a huge veteran community. I think per capita might be the largest veteran community outside of, uh, uh, I think, a, t- a town in Texas. I was going to say, I feel like the state of Texas probably has the marquee yeah, on that. They have it. They definitely have it. Yeah. But a high vet- veteran population. So good community to live in. And we, we, we operate there. We have a studio there. But there's a BLM protest. Now, here's what happens. All the right-wingers, and I'm going to call them right-wingers because they're right-wingers, right? I'm a, I'm a conservative, but I'm center Right, and I hate even illustrating that, but I want people to get the idea that I'm not a right wing person. People want to be on board with us at Philcraft and American Contingency because they're like, "Oh, we want to be part of this." Like, we're, we're, what's your stance? Well, we're whatever the right wing organization is. No offense, but I just don't want that affiliation, right? Because I'm not right wong. Is that a thing, right wong? I don't know if it is, but I like it. Right Wong. I don't even know what it means, but I'm going to use that today somewhere. <laughs> I'm not Right Wong. Um, so they, they want to get on board, but then I see all the right wingers show up. And Prescott, Arizona BLM protest is more likely the most dangerous course of action is probably people tripping over each other in Prescott. But they're spitting and yelling and like assault, like verbally assaulting and trying to get physically confrontational with a bunch of white people. I mean, it's one in six protesters apparently in the BLM movement are black. One in six. The rest are white. So you had a whole bunch of white people walking in the square protesting, didn't look violent, and then you got a whole bunch of right-wingers wearing Catch Me, Fuck Me shirts, which is like the, you know, whatever the fuck, name the shirt, right? And they're screaming and yelling, and I'm like, man. And all these people who are just normal people contact me and like, what do you think about this? Well, I think the right wung showing up at that uh, 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 BLM protest are just as guilty as the violent people enacting or inciting violence all over the United States. Like, get the fuck over yourself. You're either a person who believes in, in, in the Constitution and you want you advocate for that, which I do. I would advocate for peaceful protest. You want to protest? I don't give a fuck what you're protesting for. You want unicorns in schools? Fucking do it. But the second you get violent, Everything changes. Yeah, you're outside of the First Amendment at that point. Absolutely, you're you're you're, you're right now committing a crime, and everything that you uh, you raise your hand and and stand for is is null and void. Especially as a person who's conducting uh, assaults on human beings, and I hate that man. I hate I hate both sides of the fringe. I hate fringe anybody. Same. I, I like I like I like things to fit in the pattern, and and I don't mean that in a in a. Um, mundane sense. What I mean is, if you live your life in the pattern, understanding that there's law and order, a left and right limit, you could fucking do whatever you want. You could be a fucking former Navy SEAL, a former Green Beret, and crushing business, doing fucking well in this country. But the second that you decide that you're going to forcibly um, push your ideology with violence, with criminal activity, was spitting on fucking people, you've lost me. And all those people on both sides of the fringe, that's where we need to start trimming the fat. I mean, that's the conversations we need to have. I could not agree with you more. And this is something, so when Bishop and I were talking, we were specifically asked a question about Antifa and BLM. And I intentionally tossed it to Brian first because I know he would fucking cork (laughs) off. And I was just like, here's your fucking internet shit sandwich. 
And he did. And I got so many messages of people saying, well, what about the right wing? What about the right wing? And I, and it, my response was, first off, I was asked a question about two specific organizations. Yeah. So I answered yeah. that. And that in no way means that I have either complicit or passive support for shit on the right wing. Mm -hmm. It's people's actions that will make them my enemy, not necessarily yeah. their ideologies. It's actions. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I look when it comes to the Constitution. I'm so tired of these people who want to pick and choose the amendments or the pieces of the Constitution that apply to their argument and disregard the rest. Yeah. Like the First Amendment is key, but fuck everything else. You know, these people should be hung in the streets like, oh, you don't believe in a jury trial? You don't believe in an expedient trial of your peers? So, you know, the Fourth, Fifth Amendment, they can just get fucked? Or it, it just it's just picking and choosing. You have to value them equally or don't value them at all. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. I, I mean- I would, I would say, oftentimes people say, hey, thank you for my freedoms. And I stop them. I'm like, listen, I didn't provide you your freedoms. We, as Americans, we, we have our freedoms because they were preserved in the Constitution. The founding fathers did an amazing job of encapsulating that. And guess what? Um, I wasn't alive. So <laughs> I can't help you with that. I'd be the oldest man ever in the history of the world. However, I think that people who put on a uniform and wear... The American flag, flag, the American flag. I just said that. That was a slip <laughs> in words. I'm not going to edit that out. Don't people. edit it, man. Just, Deal with just it. Live with it. They they wear the American flag because it was issued to them and not rented or bought. Those people, I think, are putting their toes on the line to preserve the freedoms that we have. I didn't provide them, but I think both you and I stood on the line so somebody could stand in my face and try to argue with me about something that boils my blood. And I'm going to let them do it. I would, I would probably get involved if there was somebody who was on the other side of whatever metaphorical fence fence protesting in what they believed in and somebody's physically trying to stop them i probably would i would get involved and stop that because that person has the right to do it regardless of whether or not i agree with what they're saying but if you pick up a brick and you throw it at me mm. shit just got a lot different yeah all, all everything that you're absolutely right because that that's that's where everything changes that you, your your argument's no longer valid. Yeah, e, e, everything, and that's what people don't understand about these protests is there are there are numerous amounts, copious amounts of people who are peacefully protesting, but there vast it, majority I would the say. vast majority are, and but there are pockets of deliberate troublemakers that are inciting violence all over the United States. Um, like for this Kyle Rittenhouse kid. Well, you can tell based off of the arrest records and uh, where their, oh, yeah. their home addresses are. Yeah, absolutely. There is riot tourism going on for sure. And there are people, and I don't even want to say this term, but are professional insiders of violence and fuck anarchy, I guess it would yeah. be. They're getting shipped. They're getting mobilized and deployed all over the United States to be part of these riots. I mean, I've talked to law enforcement officers um, that have said they have they have targeted and seen the same exact people in different sides or on different sides of the country that they've confirmed their identities. And and you have to be an idiot, right? But when when I when I look at a group like Antifa who is problematic in the first place, you're anti-fascist but you're suppressing and dictating and Well, you're using fascist, fascist techniques. Yeah, yeah, techniques and tactics. Um but you're out in an open forum and maybe you think you're covering your face or you're running around being inconspicuous and stealthy and surreptitious, not even close. And to not think you're not being targeted by federal law enforcement agencies, that only job is to profile you and determine if you're a threat to national security. You're the dumbest idiot on the planet. And so these guys, what we've been told is these guys are action arms. They have a commander. They're running dual comms. They're talking to lieutenants on the ground, and they're art articulating uh, in this communication uh, their schemes of maneuver uh, and and their tactics on the ground. They're dictating it based on Overwatch. I mean, they have Overwatch of the entire scene via communications and and their eyeballs. Uh, they have roving patrols, and it's a, it's a deliberate skill set. So it's trained, it's properly executed, and it ties into a broader strategy, which is insurgency. And when I when people talk to me and they go, well, Mike, is this really a big deal? I mean, it's buildings, it's statues. That technically is not a big deal to me. What I'm worried about is what every movement started out as. And then what you do when you take logistical support and time, right? When you stretch the timeline, it means you have more time to prepare. 
That's on the friendly side and that's on the bad guy side. They are preparing and they are they are in their own interest, which people think they're aligned. They're very misaligned, but they all serve the same uh, uh, purpose in getting favoritism and recruiting all the people that they have by the form they've been given by these They're uh, seizing the opportunity that's in front of them is what they're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. It is, a, it, it is the opportunist wet dream. You have political people in positions of power who are suppressing law and order because of the politics that are involved and allowing law-abiding citizens to be affected, at the same time providing a huge void where opportunists are filling that void with violence, with recruitment, with assessment, with logistical support. And that ties into like, well, you want to see a deliberate operation by an insurgent unit or insurgent organization trying to conduct a coup? I mean, the coup is the next thing. A coup would be the way forward, right? You're inside of Portland. They don't want the mayor. None of the organizations actually support the mayor, who's the most progressive mayor in the history of the free world. Potentially on the face of the fucking planet. <laughs> on the planet, right? Yeah. He's, he's opened his doors and said, commit violent acts. Police, law enforcement, you can't do anything to prevent this. Which, by the way, in my opinion, is the complete dereliction of his duties. He's a criminal. To me, he's absolutely a criminal. If you look at federal, federal law, uh, any kind of litigation federally, he's committing uh, acts of, of crime. And so as he opens these gates, they're telling him uh, it doesn't matter. We want you out. They don't want any power. <laughs> what do they want him replaced with? They want they want <laughs> chop in a, in a yeah. How'd that work out for? Yeah, no, in academia. <laughs> they want they want to occupy Portland as a start point. For example, they conduct a coup. And now they own the governance. Now they're policing their own streets. And what does that look like? It probably looks like a very easy HRT target. I mean, that's that's what it looks like. It looks like a it looks like a one minute uh, objective secure call. I mean, that's a that's going to be an easy target to address. I agree, and I will. I'm going to clarify this point for people so they don't lose their mind. Although we are talking about organizations right now that traditionally sit on the left. I would feel exactly the same way from organizations on the right who are taking these actions as well. It is not a matter of left or right. It's a matter of the actions that you take against either me, my loved ones, or my fucking country. Yeah. That's what determines it for me. I'm tired of people saying, well, you're not saying anything about the right, or uh, you need to say more about the right. It's like, listen, like if you ask me a direct question about it, I'll tell you. And my stance is the same. It is based off of actions and whether or not you think you're a threat to myself or the country that you and I both put our toes on the line to at least do the, the best that we can to allow people to express whatever they want to, which is not what's going on in Portland. It's not. I mean, can you think of anything good that can come from them continuing to, to riot and protest 100 plus days? I mean, what type of precedent is that setting? That shit needs to be shut down. That's the role of the state and federal government to protect those business owners, to protect those people. And this this is what's starting to trip me out. I'm starting to see, you know, they're in D.C. and they were at the Black Lives Matter Square, I believe it's called. If that wasn't the name exact name, I apologize. But they started a protest there and then they started going into neighborhoods and they're starting to shine flashlights into people's windows. I'm like, OK. That's an interesting micro escalation. You're still not really, a, you know, but then they'll start banging on doors. What if they kick the door in? You know, now these micro escalations are going to lead to things that I don't think, like you said, it's a one minute HRT objective secure. I do not think that these people have any idea what could potentially be waiting in the wings for them. Yeah. It, the, the biggest problem in that is, you know, as it spreads into rural neighborhoods and urban neighborhoods, communities, right? These are communities where people pay uh, taxes to provide the support, the funding, literally to law enforcement officers to react and respond to calls of danger, right? Now you have people who are, for the first time, have to think about protecting themselves. Now all of a sudden, the Second Amendment matters. Now all of a sudden, it's a priority. In California, it's like, whoa, we, down with Governor Newsom because he's, he's suppressing the law. He's got security. We've been talking about that for years. He's got state uh, officers that are fully armed to bear sniper overwatch providing his security. High capacity magazines, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Probably uh, automatic weapons if it's yeah. law enforcement, which, by the way, people, 
I never love automatic. That's so weird. I answered this question. It was with Bishop. It was, we were talking about like, do automatic weapons apply to the second amendment? And I, it's my own fault for my response because I essentially said civilians don't need them, which people took as, I don't think it's covered by the second amendment. It is just don't ever use them on full auto because you can't hit shit is what I should say. That's so, that's so weird. People don't realize (laughs) that. Isn't that weird? Well, they watch a lot of movies. Yeah. And you see a, you know, a hundred round belt going through like a saw or an M60 and 98 people fall down. Yeah. Instead of seeing maybe the first round hit a guy and then the rest of them are hitting about four kilometers behind because the muzzle just. <laughs> well, I think the, the funniest one to me is the short barrel, right? So oh, they yeah. say the short barrel is the most, the biggest danger to society. And I, I'm assuming it's the, it's the way in which it can be carried in this configuration. Carried concealed, yeah. But a longer barrel is more optimized for trajectory, for external ballistics. And accuracy. And accuracy. So it, all that shit, like suppressors, for example, that people don't real it's so silent you know it's they're stealthy killers and suppressors still have massive amounts of decibels you could clap yeah. louder than a suppressor is yeah and if you're using supersonic ammunition it still sounds like a gunshot going by your head absolutely it does yeah so oh, all those laws are bizarre but the, you have those people in dc like you just mentioned now in washington dc like major metropolitan areas like philadelphia there chicago those people can't even have certain kinds of guns to protect themselves. And you see these people, who, whoever it is, there's many groups, and NFAACs is one of the groups that's just comical to me. I've actually talked to one of the dudes who wanted to do a podcast with me. Um, they're walking around with AR-15s. I was going to ask you about this. What do you think about these organizations? And you'll see them uh, on the right and the left, right? You'll see the hillbillies rolling in with their EOTechs on backwards and uh, visible uh, stovepipes, like just complete bolts out of battery on there. <laughs> ARs and uh, you know their uh, optic covers are down their aim points are on backwards and I'm just sitting there looking at this like son of a bitch but they do have two camelback hoses so I'll give them that I don't know what's <laughs> dual, in the- dual hydration man you have to run dual hydration but what are your thoughts on people and so this happened here in Kalispell there was a Black Lives Matter uh, protest in oh, one, two, three blocks away here? There- yeah wow well it doesn't surprise me because I, I think, I didn't go to it, but in talking to both of my sons who did, it was people who were, called a generation, I don't want to say behind us, but a generation younger than us. Mm-hmm. And I think they, they have a different form of information delivery and uptake. Most of my kids, you know, it's, they, they see it on a device. So and it's real. Yeah. It's real. And it's, and I'm not saying it's, uh, I, I do believe that inequality has happened in this country since its founding. It's not perfect. It's never going to be. But they felt moved to go and be part of something. So they did. And what showed up was probably equal number of people who were armed. What are your thoughts on that? The people who roll in heavy, they're wearing, they're wearing plate carriers. I don't know how many of those people actually have plates in that stuff. What are your thoughts? I think it's a bad decision. I think it's 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 horrible. Here's what it is. It's horrible tactics. Like, it's antagonistic too. It's super antagonistic. So here's the here's the exception to the rule. My my mom, she she's Korean, um, as per my Korean eyes. And uh, oh, another side note, not to hijack you, I got many emails confirming the racism in the uh, Asian cultures as well. They're like, "Fuck yeah, Mike was right. He said it." Weird. <laughs> my dude, weird. Asians are the most racist human beings on the planet. You can't get past that, man. That is that is true. Uh, my mom, she's worked forty years for her business. She has a spa in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and it's off of uh, it's off of Ramsey and and near Hay Street, which is downtown. During the BLM protest, they were burning down the marketplace or the mar- what they called the market square. It's because that place in the center of Fayetteville used to sell slaves, but it's a building. It's a historical building. It's been there since the beginning of time. It's just the building that happened to be there when the slave trade was a thing, and it it did happen. So a guy tried to light it on fire, lit himself on fire. He actually died from doing that, which is asinine. He threw a Molotov cocktail or some kind of... um, Oh, got all over him. Got all over him, set him on fire, third degree burns, wound up dying. So down the road, my mom's salon is there. She's been in Fayetteville forever. It's next to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, a lot of immigrants um, or a lot of people from different countries have came there from soldiers being married to them. Germans, 100%. Koreans, Thai, the, the list goes on because there's Air Force, Army, everything's there. 
So her business that she worked 40 years for is there, and she called me once. She said, son, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid they're gonna burn down my business. And they were, they were burning down businesses downtown Fayetteville. They were lighting stuff on fire, graffiti damage. And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll get back with you. And I contacted a dozen of my buddies from special operations who were at Bragg, who said, yes, they will go there and protect her business to make sure that it doesn't get destroyed. And a lot of people on one side of the argument go, it's just a building. Insurance pays for buildings. Well, that's not just a building, that's livelihood, right? That's the means, that's like coming to your house and I have a lighter in my hand with an accelerant and I say, I'm gonna burn down your house and if you don't let me, I'm going to hurt you, I'll burn you in it, um, but you should let me because you have insurance. Well, that's not gonna happen. I'll shoot you in the face on my front doorstep. So when, when we look at these buildings and we look at these people who are armed, like Kyle Rittenhouse, Right, This kid, 17 years old, comes from out of state like all the protesters did and shows up to defend businesses because nobody will. And I, I think that's a courageous act because there's so many people who want to do that, but so many people, even in your own community, who would never do that. If it, it could be happening down the road and they won't do that. I'm the kind of guy who, if I see that kind of chaos in my backyard and there are people who are being disaffected in a negative way, especially by by criminals, I'm gonna do something to protect them. Now, am I gonna stand in front of the building with a gun and body armor? No, because that's bad tactics. Anything to antagonize people on the road and potentially risk your life for a statue made in 1863, for a building that does have insurance, standing out there to antagonize that is a bad tactic. You know what a better tactic is? Staying inside the building, posting signs all over the, wa the walls that we will defend and protect this building and, and staying back into it and defending and protecting that building from the inside. Because if they kick in the, the door, if they break in the window and they're entering that domicile, uh, a lot of laws, including castle doctrine and uh, stand your ground laws, apply to self-defense in that, in that use. Depending on the state. Depending on the state, absolutely. There are states, uh, even California has a stand your ground law. Which they I'm vary, surprised. though. They do vary. They vary. So and che drastically. Check your local laws because the protection of property and life in some states like Texas go hand in hand. If somebody steps on your property in Texas, it, th there's the Castle Doctrine and your stand your ground laws apply. You could actually, there's actually cases of people being shot standing in property with no defined fence line and getting away with shooting somebody because that person was trespassing, giving them orders, and then and gunning them down. So that's where people need to research this on their own. So Montana, property does not apply, meaning uh, land. Yeah. If you step into the house, that's a different story. Different so story, Montana yeah. is a castle doctor. What about a business? I don't know. And I tell you what, I, uh, I think it might have been the same podcast with Bishop. We were talking about that. And I answered, uh, the answer that I gave, I... I believe in the answer that I gave, but this is the classic example of reading a question, not thinking about it and firing away for five minutes. Because I said, I don't want to see people lose their life over property. And I made a broad statement that a lot of those businesses do have insurance. But in my head, what I was thinking, I'm looking at watching videos of like Target, Macy's, yes. that shit getting looted. Corp corporate. I wasn't thinking about, uh, at least in that moment, somebody who has 40 years, somebody who has a generational tie to those businesses. So I was thinking in my head, like, is it worth shooting somebody over a purse? No. No. I don't. And, yeah. and my biggest point is this. I don't want to see Americans killing other Americans. I, would, I, yeah, I, don't I want this, the, the line in the sand drawn as far back as humanly possible and reasonable. And only when you're pushed to that point, to include myself, like I'm not going around looking for to target anybody. But if mm -hmm. you push me to that, I have a very distinct line in the sand. If you push me past that, what happens after that is going to be on you. Mm-hmm. So I totally agree with what you're saying. And it's, and, but at the same time, it, it, there's nuance, right? If they're stealing a big screen TV from Best Buy, don't go stand out in front of it with your no, AR. Absolutely not. And Kyle Rittenhouse, I tell you what, I think he might have had the best of intentions, but as a 17 and a half year old, he's not mentally prepared to go out there and be Not there. even close. And his parents should be, his mother specifically should be ashamed of herself that she took him there. After watching the videos many times, and reading it, I believe that his actions were in self-defense. The catastrophe there was that he was even physically present. 100% avoidable. Absolutely. Everything you said is exactly how I feel because that's the problem. When I, when, I, when, I, when I see people motivated to get out on the streets with guns, 
I, I asked myself, where the fuck is your family? Where, where are your kids? Where is your, where's your spouse? Where's your mom? Because that's where you should be protecting. Yeah. That's that. You should be standing in the threshold of that doorway with your car being in your body armor. If you want to wear that. Um, like, the, it, like I think about our time in the military and all the things we would have risked our lives for every single objective. I would have risked my life. Same. But I, like picking up my kit, putting it on and donning it. I accepted every time that I was going to potentially die, but I looked around and it was very easy to make that decision because everybody in that in that staging room or that kit room were men that I loved. Voluntarily there making that same decision. Yes, absolutely. And we all had that understanding. And so when I see somebody senselessly get killed in the streets because of simple exposure, dumb tactic. Don't even be out on the streets. Yeah. Like, avoid those places like the plague. And just like Tim said about people running their mouth to, to make themselves... Uh, feel good about their cause and sounding stupid these people the world knows now N not the world because they're, they're they're absolutely uh um they're they're protagonistic about everything that's happening because they're, they're like, roasting yeah, marshmallows just, about what's going oh, on Oh, dude it's insane but we know as americans what's taking place and every single one of these groups has shown their ass and hopefully what that translates to is people voting I mean, when, when people say, Mike, what can we do? It's not go load a fucking 30 round AR. You should, your mag should be already loaded, by the way. Yeah. It's it's get ready to fucking vote on November 3rd and, and be prepared to write them to make the right political decision and your local governance and, and the federal governance, because that is how you're going to affect the most change that has resounding effects. That is the system that is in place designed to make change. I'm worried that regardless of the result, what we're seeing going on, uh, and admittedly in small pockets, what, I, I'm, what I'm worried about is that it's not going to stop regardless of the outcome. It won't. It will burn regardless. It will burn. The yeah. most dangerous course of action is all over every major metropolitan area, you'll see uh, violence. And, and what I mean is, for the first time, what you'll see is these people who decided this is going to be their D-Day using weapons and killing cops. And then the cops are gonna respond and they're gonna kill, in quotations, in air quotes, protesters. But they're actually violent actors. They're criminals. They were, they were criminals before the day before and the time they picked up a gun, now they are uh, criminals again. And they're going to get in gunfights. One bad report, because the media should, should take the brunt of this, the media will report it. Um, in Portland, Oregon, police engage and kill five protesters. Two law enforcement officers were killed. That will transcend. That will evolve into gunfights in every major metropolitan area where these uh, antagonists exist, where they feel justified now to go to war. It's, it's time now. This is their war. We had our war. We went to war and we picked up arms and, and it felt good because we had a cause, right? We had... Uh, September 11th. We knew what we were fighting for. This is their war. And it's that kind of like uh, where we were looking through the eyes of the enemy and analyzing and assessing uh, the enemy, and then you actually confront them. You confront them in, the, in a room, and you're tactically interrogating them, and you realize this is just a dude just like you who wants to get his gut on. Yep. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. He, he, he thinks he's the freedom fighter. You're looking at yourself, you're like, man, look at this American flag, look at this kid, I'm a badass, I'm a freedom. He does the same thing every morning. He looks at his S vest, he looks at his, at his AK, he looks at his fucking fake solo boots, and he's like, I'm fucking ready to go to war, man. And that's the same ideology they feel, and they're going to pick up that arm, and they're going to go to fucking war, and it's not going to change anything. The, the only thing that it's going to change in America, which I feel it should change, is the way and we look the way that we look at our local govern governments and first responders and how they protect us because most people who pay taxes who don't give a shit about guns who don't care about preparedness they think that the law enforcement officers that they pay taxes for are going to come to the rescue in portland three weekends ago now when i was there 60 phone calls to 911 for burglary uh Larceny, even rape. Unanswered. Unanswered. Never responded. Why? Because the politicians that were in charge of them told them to address only the protest, and they were prioritizing that, which meant standing there getting pummeled with bottles and bricks and everything else, while people, law-abiding, tax-paying citizens of this country are getting raped 
and nobody's doing anything about it. What does that tell you? Well, that tells you you need to be more self-reliant. You just need to take what you should have been doing in the fuck, fucking first place. You need to take your own reliance into your own hands like you should be. It should have never been surrendered, at least from a philosophical perspective, to somebody else. A thousand percent. And we did. It's it's a, Look, freedom by proxy is going to um, characteristically make you complacent. That's a, that's a byproduct. It's a symptom of democracy, which when you feel secure in a world, you become less secure as an individual because you let your guard down. You should. And that's, that's great. But on the back end of that, you should understand the contingency that you're willing to you know, bring to bear in the equipment that you have, the sustaining of survivability, your own self-defense and the defense of your family. But we, we lose sight of that so often. And then we go, well, that dude was a victim. Well, he was a victim because potentially he made the wrong decisions and he was fucking complacent. Yeah. And, and, and now we can't afford to allow that to happen. The wildfires in California is a perfect example of this. Wildfires have always ravaged California since the beginning of time. I mean, me and you are from California. Yeah. And, and what we're seeing for the first time is arsonist being rolled up in mass. Because if you're, if you're an anarchist, you know the best way to start anarchy is take a lighter to fucking dry foliage in the middle of nowhere and start a wildfire that's going to devastate people. Uh, there was a kid, I think it was in Oregon, found him dead in the back of a car holding his fucking dog that's dead. A, ch a young child. Fuck. To think that some cocksucker, for lack of better terminology, lit some shit on fire to create anarchy and murdered a fucking child holding his dog that died as well. Just, it, and, and to think that this is this, this isn't Yemen. This isn't Libya or Iraq or Afghanistan. This is fucking California and Oregon. This, this tells me and shows me that no matter what you do and depending on the government around you, you need to take care of your own. You don't need to sit there and go, when's the fire department coming? What's the plan? I can't check the fucking media. When are we going to get out of it? You need to take that shit into your own hands. What's, cra what's even crazier to me is that if you were able to find that person who lit that, they would somehow try to justify <laughs> that. Like, that's the cost of anarchy. Yeah. You need to set that motherfucker on fire in the back of a vehicle. I don't know if this makes me a bad person, but I would volunteer to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I would just want to watch. I, I, I yeah. just want to watch. Yeah, man, it's crazy. You know, and I think one of the biggest points that I hope people heard when you were talking about the defense of business is that it's not actually going out and targeting and executing military operations. It's smartly drawing that line in the sand, presenting that like, hey, this is my castle. These are the things that we are prepared to do. And they come across the line. You're not out there walking around trying to draw this mobile line that you hope somebody crosses. You're, it's a measure of last resort. But, and that's the thing. And I think, fuck that podcast with Bishop pissed people off. We were talking about what would it take for uh, people like you and I to come off the bench to actually get involved. And the answer for me is I don't want to, like, that's the bottom line answer. The one thing I think I want to do the least in my life is kill an American. I don't want to. So for me, it is a matter of a direct threat to myself, my loved ones, or my family. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to go out there and try to antagonize somebody to get them across that line. But if you push me across that line, stand the fuck by. It, people don't realize the uh, – I'll frame this with, with the, uh, capability. You could have a target set. Let's just call it a, a troop of guys. Let's call it, let's call it 20 guys. 20 guys in a foreign country on foreign soil, they don't know the target set. They don't know what it really looks like, but they have imagery of what that potentially looks like. Could land helicopters on top of those people and kill 30 plus bad guys, not sleeping, 30 bad guys ready to fight with chest Barricaded. Rigs, and, barricaded. Yeah. PKMs, machine guns, even sometimes with night vision goggles. And we routinely do that. One special operations guy with a set of PVS 31s, big shout out to L3, <laughs> PVS 31 White Foss with a laser mounted to the gun. You have no, like when people say, oh, that's like you guys can enact violence. Uh, violence enacted or executed looks like efficiency. It looks like optimize. Yeah. It's like an orchestra. You don't realize it's so beautiful because it's 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 literally being conducted 
until it's after. You're like, oh my God, I, yeah. I got chills. And and what I don't ever just and I share that same sentiment. There's men just like you and me all over the U.S. who are living in peace. We're trying to and that's retain all this. I want. That's all we want because we've lived war for for the majority of our lives. And so when I'm here living in peace. And I see people who are insurgents who want war and that don't realize what war is. Yeah. And and for, for one of us to get off the bench, dude, one one me, one you, or even worse, me and you, it, it, it would be over in a night. One night. One night. And these guys think they're violent, badass anarchists who are going to burn down the system. Not on our watch. It's not going to happen. And I, I don't... I don't mean to say that like I'm antagonizing uh, the the people in that arena. What I'm saying is you don't want to fuck with the wrong people. Yeah. And what you are is you're poking. You're not even poking a fucking bear. You're poking like fucking. You're poking a fucking galaxy of of rock stars that will fucking destroy you. You you can't even fathom the amount of violence. It's, just, well, it's, it's sickening we, we, to me. We okay. made an occupation yeah. out of what seems to be currently their hobby. Yeah, yeah, and they're very bad at it. It's <laughs> very it, inefficient. Well, and here's the thing too: it our background, <clears throat> absent continued training and currency, it actually loses value as the days go by. I, I am a firm believer that you should never outsource your safety and security to the government. I don't believe that that's what the government was designed to do. There's mechanisms that can help, but I think as a responsible, contributing member of society. You need to have a baseline level of capability. So it's great. Yeah, I spent 17 years in the SEAL community. Awesome. But I got out in 2013, seven years ago. My days look like two hours a day of jujitsu, Monday through Friday and sometimes on Saturday, three days at the range per week, pistol, rifle, med kit in my car, go bag in my car, SBR, suppressed 300 blackout, secure- Feel survival med. Uh, <laughs> it is. <bug> out <laughs> it's a bug out bag. But I have- I carry with me all the time. I have, you know, and also I have safes at my house. I'm a responsible gun owner as well. It's not just like, uh, throw a pistol on the couch and hope that it's still there when I come back. And I, and I carry all of those things because I don't ever want to have to rely on somebody else. Kalispell, perfect example. If I'm at the south end of the valley and there's something going on at the north end of the valley and then something happens with me, I can expect a 30 minute response time from law enforcement. Yeah. That's a long fucking That's time. a long time. And... That's better, though, than 60 unanswered calls, you know, but I want to be able to live for that 30 minutes. I'm not doing any of the things that I just talked about because I think I'm a badass because I'm not a badass. I'm a fucking very average dude from a physiological, emotional to uh, intelligence perspective. But I understand that world. I understand the competency that can come from that and the capability that can come from that. So I'm not just going to hang the knife up. You got to keep taking stone across the blade. It's it. And then you, yeah, God, can you imagine if you and I were able to get the reins pulled off and we were to go to a place like Portland? And for people listening, stop screaming at your phones. I'm not saying I want to do that or that we are advocating doing that. What I'm saying is there's a difference between a hobbyist and a professional, and it's not going to go their way. Yeah. Yeah. I just, my brain just goes there. And I, I just think these guys and gals are making super poor life decisions. I mean, I see you see this twenty year old girl throw a Molotov cocktail into a patrol car. Oh, this was in New York, right? Yeah, and she goes, she's going to prison for like li a life term, which I think is a twenty year, whatever it is. She got convicted of of uh, attempted murder. And I believe, and not that this is a uh, really anything, but I think it should be pointed out. She comes from a upper middle class, affluent, yeah, a very affluent. I would say probably beyond upper middle class background, and mm -hmm. she's out there throwing a Molotov cocktail into a. It's like I. Uh, for me, there's such a, a a gap. I don't understand, and I don't know. Maybe you and I are just wired differently, but I don't understand getting from that place to where it terminates in throwing a Molotov cocktail, thinking that you are somehow closing a gap between your projected ideas and the solution. I don't. I just don't understand it. And then that's a. I think that's a good point because there probably isn't an end state. You know, like when you have a when you take somebody off the streets and you actually start talking to them and you say, "What is the desired end state here?" And the des desired end state is, I think, destroying the system because the system is systematically racist or systematically flawed. That inherently is a problem because 
then you're hinging on the majority of the country to be on board with you while you destroy everything that's in place that is the security for everybody else in the country. Absent a plan to rebuild as well. There's no plans. And so you don't have a, you know, it would be different if an Antifa guy or a BLM guy was on a podcast or a show and they were the leader and they're saying, listen, we're going to lay out the groundwork. What we're doing now is part of a five-tiered plan. We're starting out with uh, sabotage, subversion. Uh, we, we want to create some anarchy on the road because we want to let people know we're passionate. But phase two of this is we want to get into the elective process. Like We want to be in positions to make change. I would be like, holy shit, the strategy behind this is insane. And and it's not that I would be on board that because I would say, hey, let's get the bandwagon on to vote because I don't want this but this is how we control. You'd be using the system that is in place for the, yeah. Our process is very damn good. And everybody who's in these positions that say we are a racist society, we're oppressive, we're tyrannical, have never been anywhere else in the world. And they've, you don't even have to go and be immersed as a special operations guy. Just simply go to anywhere in Africa. Yeah. Like anywhere. Travel outside of the first world. Th- that's it. Go to, like when I was in Niger, Africa, my my driver um, had a heart attack, and w- we couldn't find. While a he was driving, while he was driving, like, Jesus. like he's. Li- I'm, I'm in. I'm a sergeant major at the time, so I'm in uniform with this lieutenant colonel, and we're on the way to a, a, a joint training exercise, which is a staff ex. It's we're we're planning a counter. We actually planned a counterterrorism operation, and at the the same time that we were there planning it, uh, Boko Haram attacked a uh, place in eastern Niger, which was their first ever attack, a huh. terrorism attack inside of Niger. So we're there. This is part of Flintlock, which is a huge joint exercise. Fucking awesome name for an exercise. I know, Flintlock. It's awesome. <laughs> um, and and we're, I'm, I'm driving to this place, and the, the driver turns around, and he's like, I'm, I'm having bad chest pains. I'm like, well, pull over. And he pulls over. And he's telling me his symptoms. And I think, I can't remember what side it was, but one of the symptoms is his arm shooting pain through his like left arm. Yeah, like one side only. One side only. Yep. And <laughs> the lieutenant colonel I'm with is like Googling <laughs> shit. He's like, what do we, how do we figure out how to help this dude with a heart attack? So I say, listen, I'm going to drive you to the hospital. I want you to point out to me the quickest route there. And we have it navved, but he knows the back roads. So he's like, oh, left, uh, right. He gets us to the hospital and I pull him out of the car. And I walk him up to the hospital and I take one look inside. I'm at the breach point and I look left, look right, and just do a quick scan. And there's people all over this hospital laying on pants, not not cots, not cloth, not sheet, but pants, like metal pans. And it looked like a mass casualty. And I said, uh, is there something I should know about? He's like, this is normal. I'm like, what? So I go over, I was like, is anybody a doctor? And this like 18 year old kid comes up, he goes, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I'm like, you're the doctor. I'm like, are you yes. a doctor or are you playing one on TV? Yeah. <laughs> Where did you stay last night? How does this work out? Yeah. So he said, I'm a doctor. I'm like, okay, what is going on here? He goes, oh, a whole bunch of people are sick. I'm like, okay, this guy's got having a heart attack, cardiovascular or something. When can he get seen? It's going to be hours. Uh, he'll be dead in hours. So we leave. We drive away and I go, we're going to a phar- pharmacy because the... <laughs> In a heart attack, and, and I'm you not a baby aspirin. Yeah, I would put this out. I'm not a doctor, and I don't know anything about cardiovascular uh, events, except that on Google it said get beta blockers because beta blockers, I guess, has something to do with reducing the amount of beta whatever inside the blood. I feel like they block betas. They block betas. <laughs> They're the blockers of beta. I beta also blockers. shocker did not go to med school. <laughs> um, so we go in this pharmacy, and it's closed. It's a, it's a holiday. Of course it's closed. It's closed. Fuck. And so we're trying to call people, and I'm like, fuck it. We kick in the door to this pharmacy. Me and the lieutenant colonel, we f- ravage through all the shit, and we find the beta blockers. We give it to him, and almost instantly, he's like, I feel a little bit better. And I'm like, oh, shit. So we take him back to the hospital, and we drop him off. He sees the doctor eventually. They basically give him the same thing. They, they work through whatever it is. Three days later, we don't hear from him. And I'm like, where the fuck is this guy at? He's our driver. Like, where's our driver? One of the interpreters is like, he's at the hospital still. I go in the hospital and he's laid up in the same room with all these people. And he's like deathly ill because he gets sick from being in the hospital. Of course he did. They never released him. They didn't have a room to isolate him. 
And I'm like, what the fuck is going? And then I realized this is Niger, Africa. There is no, there's no resources. There's no medical trauma facilities. If people die of ap- appendectomies there, their ap- appendix burst and then they die, which is probably an incredibly routine procedure in the first. Completely world. routine, completely routine, and people die there. It's the first time, you know. I've been all over these shitholes, but I look at the infrastructure there and went, oh, "There's infrastructure." But the only reason the infrastructure exists is because of the nonprofits and the NGO, non-government organizations that keep that place alive. Yeah, they're supported. That they're support from the well water they drink to the sanit. I had an up- upper respiratory infection for two weeks with the lieutenant colonel, and I-, I couldn't believe how sick I was. And I asked everybody, "I'm like, what's going on?" And you're sick because you're breathing the literal feces of human beings. And then I'm driving one day, and there's a guy who's walking. He's a Nigerian. He's walking down the road, and there's no sewage systems in, in Niger, even in the in the in the uh, hotels. It's just piped out and poop into the streets. He takes a step, not not like three steps. He doesn't cover his ass. He takes one step. That was probably uh, to avoid getting hit by a car when he squatted his ass over the dirt and shits in the middle of the road. He takes a, a, a scoop of sand, shoves it up his ass, pulls his pants up, and keeps walking. And I'm like, wow. And then the dust is kicking up in our, Tico- our Hilux, yeah. and I'm breathing in that. I'm like, oh, that's why I'm sick. I feel like that would be a good scent for like a holiday candle. <laughs> Nigerian ass. Nigerian ass. Power move on the handful of sand. Although you might get some chafing based off my experience in buds. Dude, I was in um, Kenya for not even anything military related. I was there for a school building project for CrossFit. And there was a medical clinic across the road. And I'm using the term clinic in the lightest of terms. And they were talking about women who will walk there, give birth and wheelbarrow their child back home in the same fucking day. Of course. Of course. Like, I, I was just, I, I, my jaw hit the floor. It's still on the floor there. I couldn't believe that. And yeah. that, I mean, and so we were walking around building some schools, or I wasn't building any schools. We were there helping the uh, organization that we were funding. They were building the schools, but went on a walk one afternoon, just following people with the buckets on their heads and then watching where they were getting their drinking water from. Uh, you couldn't have paid me to to jump in that water in a dry suit. And they're filling it up, and it's the women that were doing it, jugs on their head, like National Geographic type trains of, you know, human trains of people with water on their head. It's like, you know, you know, people forget that about a third of the world doesn't even have access to sanitary water. Yeah. Yeah, that's normal life for everybody in the world. For a third of the world. We're like in the top billions 1% of, people. of all wealth in, in, in the entire world. <sighs> Context. It is context. I you, I saw this interesting documentary on Africans, and it was it had a uh, and she was from Ethiopia, maybe Kenya, and they they don't use diapers. What they use is clay. So what the woman will what? do is yeah they'll, they'll the baby will shit. They'll take a piece of clay off the ground. They'll smash it onto their knee. Then they'll take the baby and smash the baby's ass on the clay and rub it off their knee. Then they'll take the clay and roll it like it's a diaper and then throw it out. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. That's, I mean, th- this is the state of the world around us. <laughs> and these fuckers are, you know, they're throwing freaking $50 bottles of vodka at police officers uh, that are Molotov cocktails going to their suburbia. Like most of them live in the suburb. These aren't, these aren't poor people. These aren't, aff- they're disaffected. Whether that's socially, economically, but most of them have roofs over their heads, running water. Yeah, uh, you know it's fucking crazy, man. I don't know about you, man, but like I'm try. I spend. I don't think I spend any more time thinking about this stuff than anybody else. But I, I'm, I'm trying to understand. I mean, I'll at least listen to people when they talk, whether I agree or disagree. I'll, I'll sit there and I'll try to think about my own life and my own experiences. And, you know, the, the systematic racism is something that you hear all the time and inequality or colorblind or the inability to be colorblind or bias. And I sit there and I think about it and my head just keeps bouncing up against a lot of the ideas that are being thrown out. Tim actually got me thinking very hard when he was talking about his bias. Because for a long time, for one, I'm not colorblind because I have the ability to see color. Like, I think that's a stupid statement. Unless you are legitimately colorblind, it, 
everybody sees color. Mm-hmm. Your skin is a different color than mine. The issue is, I don't give a fuck what color people's skin is. I almost always default back to actions and how they treat me. If you treat me like an asshole and you threaten me, if you're white, black, every color in between, that's going to get you one response. Otherwise, we sit have a conversation. I don't, I don't give a shit. But I do have more bias than I realized. But it's not against one group. Well, it is against one group. It's human beings. Yeah. I have one of the, the things that I have to work myself through or I, I'm aware of is that I have an inherent distrust of human beings, mm. which I think is a tricky place to view a lot of the stuff that's going on from because I almost just don't trust them from the get-go. That's a, that's a good bias when compared to – I think that's a, a – you know what? I think that's probably the SOP for most people now. And 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 it's seen as racism, but it's a it's a larger distrust. And there's no race in that. I don't. There's no race at all. Fucking humanity. I, I don't either. I'm yeah. the same way, man. I, I, you know, one of the things I think about, like even in this Black Lives Matter movement, Antifa, is when I was young, people, when you when you're young, you're impressionable. You want to be whatever it is that you're tuned into. For uh, sure. I I listened to country music as a little kid. I wanted to be a rancher, a, a country ki- kid. I listen, you know, these young kids grow up in hip hop. They listen to Jay Z. They want to be a coke dealer. They listen to Biggie Smalls. They want to, they want to sell coke, like because that that's the big game, right? That's the big uh, influence. So all these little groups have people who are the the targets, just like they would be of jihadist, of uh, it named the rogue organization or the insurgent organization overseas. They're the perfect opportunity. What I what I hate that these people don't know and it's it's likely to aptitude right or or education or and or both is they don't realize they're being played right because there's mechanisms like political mechanisms where politicians have power they have wealth but they also have the ability to influence on mass scales and uh, I talked about this on years ago on a podcast somebody asked me my buddy Mike Pfeiffer from Last Line of Defense he asked me he goes what are the what are, what is the biggest threat to our society? And I said a pandemic with social discourse. And we're literally living that now. I said it's a pandemic with social discourse and at the time BLM was in Baltimore burning it down. It, it was in and, and and we had um we had people going out and being disaffected because of bots uh that the whether it was the russians or the north koreans or whoever it was north koreans probably they're they're still working commodore 2000s in <laughs> north korea um but C- control alt delete still means something to <laughs> <Yeah>. them <laughs> but the chinese and the russians right well if they're influencing anarchy and chaos like tim i love this conversation. tim nailed it it's not left or right they just want people to be upset they want people to be disaffected yeah because when you're disaffected you you lose trust in the establishment when you lose trust in the establishment, you destroy the system internally because of that loss of, of dist- or that distrust. So when, when people were like, you know, Russia is backing Trump or whatever it may be, in special operations, it's a simple unconventional warfare tactic, which is called sabotage and subversion. When you wanted to destroy it from the inside out, the only thing you have to do, just like Timmy said, it's super easy to just, I love, like, I, you know, I love you, Timmy. Uh, in fact, you need to be on a podcast. You just hit me up the other day. I I'm actually going to call him Timmy from here on out. I, I love calling him Timmy. He calls him <laughs> Mikey, so I call him Timmy. But um, one of the things he, he made the example of the analogy about is a party, right? He made the, the oh, yes. he said, yeah, you have this party and it's, you have all these mechanisms in the party, the this art sculpture, the ice sculpture, the bathroom, people are, are, are inside that group, and they're all there for the right reasons. But it takes one fuck up to come inside of there and destroy it from the inside out. It's like, it. The, another analogy is like the redneck wedding, right? You have, you have a redneck wedding, and somebody comes in there and makes one dumbass statement. They do one dumb thing. They're like, fuck that dude. And it's like, don't tell, <laughs> don't talk about Ricky Bobby like that. And then they fucking start beating each other up. And then you're like, I can't fucking believe this. Everybody's beat up in blood. And then everybody forever remembers that moment, but also everything about that as being dysfunctional and chaotic. Yeah. If you look at the world's perception of us right now, you would think this place is burning to the fucking ground. You would think that this is this is World War Three, but it's not. 
I mean, me and you are in a room. I drove here, got coffee, and then and, and Whitefish drove in. It, it's beautiful. Everybody's out and about. Half the people wearing masks because they don't give a fuck. And I'm like, dude, this place is awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it feels like a good place to be in, but that perception is what they're trying to create. When you have wealth, when you have power and influence, it's so easy. You could, I get people, for, I tell people at these American contingency meets, I had like a few hundred people show up in, um, in, uh, in uh, Oregon. It was a, no, 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 this one was in Washington, outside of Goldendale at a winery. And I said, think how easy it was for me to get you to show up. I did three posts. In three posts, I got 300 people to show up. And maybe with a fourth post, I could have got them to throw a rock at a building. So it's not hard to take people who are disaffected, who are emotionally uh, compromised anyway because of COVID. They want something to belong to because they're disaffected. They don't have a fucking mentor in their life. They might not even have a father or a parent. And they want to be part of a fucking movement. Our movement was service. I, dude, I lived the U.S. Army. Be all you could fucking be. Same. Yeah. And, and so we took our energy and we harnessed it and we pointed it in the right direction. Now we're doing the same in entrepreneurship. When I wake up, I'm fucking motivated that, I mean, it's sad that I'm not getting shot at because I, I enjoyed that part of my life. It's not sad. It's, it's yeah, a different phase of your it's life. It's a different phase. Let's not describe it as sad. It's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I, I miss that part, but I, the same amount of energy that I have and that I invested in the military, I'm investing it in entrepreneurship and it's a fucking great life to live. But these assholes have picked the wrong direction, the wrong path, because they're motivated by some fucking millionaire who's a politician, more likely, who's sitting on their ass watching unfold like fucking Mr. Uh, who's that dude? Mr. Burns from fucking The Simpsons. Yeah, Mr. Burns, for sure. I also think that the media has a very heavy handed role in this that's not being examined enough. They if uh, you know, if people are being played, the media is the instrument. Why? Because like you said, we're talking about there are parts of the U.S. that are burning right now, you know, literally and metaphorically. California, the Western states, that's a different issue. But some of them, like you said, sparked by either an anarchist or some fuckwits who did a gender reveal and started like, <laughs> did you see that one? I fucking saw that. God damn Dude. it, people. Don't put pyrotechnic devices <laughs> by dry grass. Fuck. Let's just use a popper, like a God. fucking a balloon. How about get some paper and turn it into like little cuttings of paper? Fucking mache. Yep. Yeah. God damn it. <sighs> I get so upset. But but what is being reported? And I base this off of what I – completely non-scientific. I guess it would be subjective because I'm just looking at it. The things that are happening in Portland and Seattle and other areas, they're leading the news constantly at the front of the cycle. But it's not – it's not – it is not who we are as a country and it's not what's going on in the vast majority of the country. And – People see that and they are moved to take action. They're being fucking played. Yeah, all by the headlines. I, the the rapper Killer Mike. I talked about this recently on a podcast, but full disclosure, I have no idea who that. Person I don't know is. who the fuck it is either. I've never listened to Killer Mike. I don't even know who the fuck it is. But I, I what I, what I know is he's the first rapper outside of uh, what's his name, the the Wayne, Little Wayne. Little Wayne's a supporter of law enforcement. Okay, so full disclosure, I don't know who Little Wayne is. <laughs> so I know little. I know who You're Little Wayne is. You're going down a genre he that He went I... down a rock and roll road, and I was like, who this fucking rapper's fucking cool. Um, so Little Wayne is a fucking rap, like a full, a mouth full of fucking, like his grill is full of fucking metal. You, you He's got dread, uh, I think dreadlocks or braids or something, but he's a, he's a fucking hardcore rapper. I think he's from Florida or for, from the South. Never been in, into his music, but I heard him talk about a law enforcement officer one, once. And he said, I support the police. I mean, in his gangster verbiage, he, yeah. he said, Ebonics, I think we call that. Um, I don't he, think you can say that, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm riding a fucking thin line here, man. <laughs> you might have just treaded over it, but you said it, not yeah. me. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's talking and he's like, he's like, yeah, I support the fucking cops. And the person, the person is like shocked. They weren't expecting that. I mean, how the fuck can you like? Yeah. You're about the movement. How how the fuck? You are this cookie cutter. You are only allowed to say these things. Yeah. He these his he was in an apartment or, or a house that got raided by the police, and a, a, an officer, a white dude named Bob or Bill or some shit. W they went in there and they started flipping shit, going through everything, and and they said. uh the guy, Bill or Bob, said, what the fuck are you guys doing? 
And like we're looking for some like we're for, we're here for that fucking guy. And they roll the fucking guy up and and he picked this kid up, which is little Wayne, and scooped him up and fucking rolled his ass out of there and saved him from this circumstance. And he said it's the first time that a uh he didn't frame it this this way. I'm parastoring it. But he basically said this dude was the first dude to show empathy to me as a fucking young thug. And he was a white dude named Bill or Bob, who was a police officer. I'm going to say it was Kevin. Yeah, it, was, it might have been Kevin. It might, <laughs> might, have, might have been Kevin. But, it, but if you think about that, man, what the news media cycle never talks about is, is the good in people, right? It's built off an algorithm that is making clicks per capita. Right. So when you look at the monetization rates of how these companies like CNN stay in business outside of their investments is they need to be controversial because that's how you become popular. You can't be popular as anybody on Instagram if you're not showing your ass in a thong. Right? If you if you show your ass immediately, you get you get a spike in analytics. Is that what I'm missing? You're missing that, man. The I will, side. I will do that. Pull side. Well, the smoke once the smoke clears, I'll do a mountain yeah. backdrop. I dare thong you, shot. just one. Just tag me. Be in very it so I can careful what everything. you dare me to do because I, I will fucking you. do it. <laughs> you don't even need a thong, just a banana hammock, <laughs> but just tuck back up in your ass, just a couple of cheeks. That will be the highest post, don't, grossing post. Don't tempt me. Do it, man. <laughs> just ranger panties, but it's tucked up in your ass. I don't wear ranger panties, but I might be able to find a pair of UDTs. I bet you could find some UDTs. I, I could. Could Even, you stick those khakis up your ass? They're not very good at those the are UDT? like Daisy Dukes. <sighs> I don't know. We could explore this Full, space. Roll them on the legs. Of course. So you just get a little ass cheek. Yeah. Peg the legs. 1,000% that will be your... I'll pay it on Facebook <laughs> to push it. That'll be your most popular ad in fucking history. <laughs> Fuck, man. But you, you can't be... You can't be um, making money. You can't be spiking analytics unless you're risque and, and you're no longer popular if you're not doing that. I cycle through all media channels. I do that routinely as a hobby. And I look at what their like what their headline is versus what the content says. And oh, I catch that shit dude, all the time. Is it's, it's not even the same. You'll story. never believe what so and so said, and then you click on it, and yeah, they're they're actually detached from completely content subject. Uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. unbelievable how many times that happens. It, it, it has to be, and it, it is a marketing tactic in order to spike analytics. But they're weaponizing human beings. That's the that's the scary thing. And people, I hope, understand or have at least some um, recognition that the information that you see is not a broad. If it's a pie, you're not getting one sliver from 360 degrees. The platforms that we all willingly participate in, Instagram, Facebook, and all that stuff, they are throttling certain types of information. And if you don't recognize that, I'm not saying I don't want to go conspiracy theorists and say that they're trying to really navigate, but they're also not giving you the full spectrum either. And I've yeah. heard you talk about this with a lot of your content that what I don't know what the fucking term is shadow banning or whatever that is. Yeah. But and you're basing that, I'm assuming, just off of uh, engagement and the numbers and just looking like what's going on here? Like there's this sine wave. I don't believe that's happening accidentally. And it scares me to think that people don't inherently realize that. Yeah, that's the scariest thing because it, it what falls into their feed is like what falls into your fucking lap. I mean, if if it if it falls in your feed, you're paying attention, and you and whatever that is is going to drive your behavior, right? This uh, social media platforms are are built off of uh, buying and monetizing off your attention. If they're not grasping your attention, like if you take if you look at a chick's ass and it's engaging, which means you're spending more than a second on it that they're going to send more to your Explorer page of chicks' asses. That's All you why, need to do is go on Instagram yeah. and hit the, uh, what is it, the uh, eyeglass little button. Yeah, that's it, the and Explorer page. Yeah, that's so what I'm saying, the Explorer page. And what you'll notice is it's going to give you the things that you most constantly or uh, most likely take a look at. <laughs> I so want to look. Look at your shit right now. And, you look and at your shit. Just look at, the, look at the top 12 photos, and let's see what it is. Mine's going to be dudes and thongs. <laughs> it's going to be a fucking dudes and banana hammocks. <laughs> Seals with their shirts off. All right. So you got to hit the little explore yep, page. Explore page. Fre this has got to be cold. Oh, God. You don't even want to fuck. The first thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Go to go scroll down right here like this to where it's like just these pictures and describe the first top th six uh, photos. Uh, my first one is amazing. It's a great white shark getting ready to fuck something up. I have that same fucking picture. Awesome. And okay. then it's a woman kind of clothed and then... <laughs> 
not clothed, then Conor McGregor, <laughs> then a dude rock climbing, and then the rest of them Is are- Is it that Conor McGregor? It was, no, he, uh, it's this one. He's doing his little walk. I guess oh. he got arrested in Corsica or something like that. Yeah. Uh, the vast majority of it is, it's yeah, it's women in swimsuits. It's and then for whatever reason, I get a lot of CrossFit stuff in my feed too. Well, you're watching it. That's why. Why is it? It's unfortunate, but that was like the first picture that popped up. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. This is so yeah. If you think that they're not paying attention to your interface of their device, and that's and that's the point. Is like they're they're. This goes right back again. God damn it. This podcast is brought to you by Tim Kennedy, by the way. I, it, it should be. It, it has to be. But by being removed and getting your information through that, and if they're targeting you, which is, I think, the correct and most accurate word of what's going on. Because if you look at this, this Instagram is not paying for itself, right? It's they're, not. That's why they're worth billions of, course. of dollars. Yeah. And you're insulated, and you keep looking at the same thing, so their algorithm keeps showing you the same things. I just hope that it's not lost on people that it's getting more and more and more and more channelized, which mm-hmm. I think we would be better served if it got broader and broader and broader and broader, but I think that would probably destroy the revenue model. It would. And, and the, Because people do not want to see or engage with something that bumps up against something philosophically in between their ears, yeah, which lose, is what they would actually benefit from. Yeah, they lose that dopamine hit. You start getting, you, you start losing dopamine. I, I, here's something that I physiological have, physiologically have paid attention to. I audiobook constantly. Mm-hmm. So if I'm driving for 10 hours, I'm listening to 10 hours of audiobooks. And what I've what I've realized is all my audiobooks are the same shit. Hunting, outdoors, um, survival, cool shit, military history. So I started buying audiobooks that I don't necessarily think I'd like. That's the best way to put it. Yeah. Meaning I'm not going to get the do- I'm not going to get one I'm not going to be motivated to click on it. Two, listening to it, it's not going to drive motivation and, and dopamine. I'm not going to get excited. And then three, I'm forcing myself to learn something that I potentially wouldn't otherwise have learned. The shitty part about it is I don't listen to any of those audiobooks. <laughs> I fucking start them for like a sentence and I'm like, fuck this boring shit. Dude, I've literally driven my truck falling asleep, and I'm like, I have to get some fucking Rogan on. I have to get some stump on. Like, I can't fucking do it, man. So we just always revert back to our fucking habits no matter what. Yeah. And it's machine learning, which is the scariest. When a, when a smart coder slash developer builds a machine, which is software, that essentially learns your, your patterns of life and rhythm and then optimize it and accelerates it for and fucking monetization you. and target your ass, you're fucked. And everybody can do this experiment. What I want you to do right now is put the podcast on pause or listen to it, but go onto your phone into Safari or whatever you would use. Do a Google search, and I want you to look for a product. You pick the product, and then scroll into your social media platforms and watch what populates your feed. Yeah. And tell me that you're not being targeted. Oh, yeah. E- easily targeted. <laughs> like it, It's, you know, I'll look for... Uh, I was actually looking at a, like a truck, a back of the um, truck seat weapons mounting system. Mm-hmm. And that's about all I saw on social media for the next three fucking days. The Damn. very first ad was boom, 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 boom. I'm like, are you kidding me? Wow. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It's the, just, yeah. The, the web is so interconnected. It is. So ridiculously interconnected. And it is a learning machine yeah. that is learning how fucking stupid we are as humans. I, I, I heard Rogan say this, and I heard you talk about it with the the media as well. I'm going to start. I'm going to try. This is my fucking attempt. This is my launch code of this. I'm going to attempt to start a media company. Um, but I want to ask you because I, I want to get your input. I'm starting a media company that is is as objective as it can be in the context of serv- of uh, let's put it this way open source information that's going to allow you to make better decisions to navigate the world around you i.e. you get local or even national news that tunes you into what's going on that's after the fact meaning it's not it's not a story for the sake of a story and narration to draw people in it's this is happening and and this is the area it's objective and here's the recommendation, maybe like like open source intelligence analysis, yeah, which is you know the significant activity that's going on, and then the recommendation for that, but not as dry as the fucking military. It's not like a 
you know, a, a sit rep that you read on a daily. What were what are some characteristics of of good good news outlets or what you would like to see in a news app or a news feed? Fuck. A good news outlet. I'll start there. I don't know which one I could point anybody towards because I feel like most and I, you know what? I'd have to use the term news lightly as well. It's editorialized information, I think, is a more accurate description of what most people are receiving. So I guess what I would like to see would be the opposite of that, as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to do that other than leaving almost every article open-ended, presenting the facts and and not, you know, not don't write out every time, but literally be like, now you, as an intelligent thinking human being, need to figure it the fuck out for yourself. Yeah. Is that like a bullet, like bullet statements? So it's not, it's not a, it's not rolled up into a storyline. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because if you have somebody writing it, they will, like we've talked about, there are there is bias, and they will write it through that. So it would require you to have people on both sides of whatever metaphorical aisle that you're talking about that either worked in tandem or separately, and then the shit to to somebody from one side of the fence. They each write it and you present both and people can land in the middle. I don't know if it's bullet points. It gets tough anytime that uh anytime that, that there's a human being interface in between the information, you know. Yeah. Fuck, I have no idea. I would need some time to wrap my head around that. Yeah. What, I like the idea though. What would make it popular? That see, that's the that's the one thing I can't figure out because when you look the fact, at the fact that it would be unpopular, that people would have to think. Yeah. That, you would literally <laughs> have to do that, right? Yeah. You would have to play off the uh, the uh oxymoron of it all because every news outlet even fox news which i i look at both the same objectively yeah and i go fuck both of these guys like if you look at fox news the first couple scrolls like going through they'll have actually news stories and then they get into weird shit like kardashians yeah heidi klum was seen on the beach wearing a fucking thought and you're like what the fuck and i click it anyway i'm just trying to for research purposes i'm like of course for research yeah i'm like (laughs) 10 scrolls down i'm like i haven't seen heidi klum's ass once scam right it's it's just a (laughs) it's a deep rabbit hole you're like what the fuck am i here um but it but it but it makes it popular that's what makes it popular i'm like how the fuck do you make objective actual news popular maybe the way it's told I need to get a funny fucking comedian. Yeah, but then you're going to piss off 50% of the people because you'll be mocking their, you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's always the lens that people are going to view it through. I, dude, I don't have an answer to that question. That's a tough one. It it's is the a toughest tough one. thing. Like I'm, if, here's what happened with American contingency that is evolving, which I never thought this would happen. American contingencies, the entire purpose of American contingency is giving people purpose. There's like people are like, oh, you're starting a militant move. No, the fuck we're not. I've never messaged that. I've never disseminated that in the written word, speaking it. N- never. It's only been about empowering people to be better prepared for themselves, for their families and their communities, which by I think by benefit makes us all better citizens of, of the country. I right? couldn't agree more. So yeah. I, and I was going to ask you specifically about the Amer- American contingent. Go back. Like, where did it come from? Why did you decide to start it? Just unpack the whole thing. Yeah. So. Um, me and Kevin Owens were in Colorado and the COVID f- shit was falling apart. And we were, we actually were doing a podcast. He was just on the mic drop one. He was right? okay. The, one of the, one of the most phenomenal human beings on the planet. He's in, uh, in Montana with me right now in a different location. Irish born, course. right? Irish born was a counterterrorism, uh, army ranger wing operator. Uh, they have a tier one element. He was there for like five, six years doing what they do similar to the British SAS. Yep. And uh, became a Green Beret, was my small unit tactics instructor. We were snipers together and then changed the entire sniper game for us. I mean, he was the sniper NCIC, a non commissioned officer in charge of the entire school. People are like, God damn it, Mike, what is that? (laughs) But, you know, CAG snipers, um, Ranger snipers, and SIF snipers, and Special Forces snipers, he was in charge of that schoolhouse. But we're in a conversation and it, it came up about the beginnings of this shit falling apart. Like people were protesting. And I Oh, so you're in COVID watching some of the things trend towards violence. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's there's compounding factors. Okay. And I was like, you know what, I, I would I would want to start something. And we had talked about the getting off the bench concept. Like, you know, there's people all around this of the United States who are law abiding citizens who are sitting on the bench watching everything unfold. They they don't participate 
and surveys. They aren't active politically. They just fucking do their job. Right? Yeah. They're blue collar, white collar people who just Nose do to their the job. grindstone people who are just trying to make it through the day. Exactly. Just that's the core of America. So what I realized was it, this happened in Portland, not based on three weeks ago, but months ago, they had a situation where they told their, this actually started in Seattle, but the Seattle uh, mayor told their law enforcement officers not to respond. They had to prioritize, and they said, you will not respond, and you will not do anything um, call-related. And a dispatch person reached out to me, and a law enforcement officer reached out to me. And I realized, I went, oh, shit. Then I, then I, at the same time, maybe a couple of days later, the uh, not-fucking-around coalition. Which all they're doing is fucking around. <laughs> Can we be clear? It should be called a fact, right? Yeah, they are <laughs> fucking, fucking around. around coalition. He had fucking NCOIC of those fuckwits. <laughs> Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, he, he thinks a M16 fires from the open bolt. What did he call that thing? He called it the uh, grease gun. Yeah. I'm like, come on. It's the he's, open bolt. He thinks that you, you launch the bolt and it sends the projectile shooting. But Mike, he's a veteran. Uh, it's so bizarre. He is a veteran. A fucking bizarre. Do you know what that means? <laughs> nothing. All it, right? Absolutely It really nothing. doesn't mean that fucking much, people. Get rid zero. Of, get rid of that fucking halo or whatever you think it means. It's, zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, he says all the people in the organization, including the guy who accidentally discharged him, uh, his weapon and injured another person that's standing next to him. Yeah, because the NFAC people were facking. Yeah, they're fuck, <laughs> fucking, <laughs> fucking fackers, man. <laughs> um, it's so fucked up, man. So these guys, these guys are fucking off and they're, they're fucking around and they're calling people outside of their homes, which I thought was, you know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to start protesting even with guns, right? which I think is stupid, but you're fucking doing it. And they start calling people out. And they're calling like, they're saying, all you crackers, come outside of your home. And my, my nickname when I was a kid was Cracker. My dad was a fucking white dude, right? And he used to call me Cracker. And I took that as a term of endearment. But he means it as a term of racism. He yeah. might as well be saying the N-word to black people, but he's saying calling white people Crackers. It's just as offensive. Isn't it interesting, though, how it's not, it doesn't seem to be recognized nobody even gives a shit yeah racism uh, and i and i hear this well you have to be in a position of uh what is it power or authority to be racist how about fuck you yeah. how about treat everybody exactly the same and if you're making any decision based off of whatever position you were in based off color ethnicity whatever it may be you're fucking racist that, how about that absolutely and i don't think it's inclusive um to to one set of people yeah um when i was called chink and and all the ching chong and all this shit which I thought was funny because I, I, I like to laugh off people who are fucking losers. Um, but it, it, it hurts. I mean, that, that shit's real. I mean, that's, that's racism, no matter what color you fucking are. So I went, these racist people who are calling people outside of their homes, that's scary. We got an influx through my company, uh, Philcraft Survival, which we do preparedness shit. I mean, we teach hundreds of training we teach courses. teach Philcraft. We teach Philcraft all and, over the fucking and world. And survival. And survival. I don't know how you came up with that name, Philcraft yeah. Survival, given what you teach. Yeah. Philcraft it, and survival. It was a shit ton <laughs> of shit. It was, the, 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 you don't even want to know the naming You're game. like, God damn it, what do we teach? We teach Philcraft and survival. Hmm, I have an idea. <laughs> Let's call it Tradecraft. <laughs> yeah. um, fuck, man. Uh, I had all this shit lined out and I started realizing via all the messages that we got, which is hundreds and maybe even thousands. What was the general sentiment in the message? What do we do? Yeah. That's the I, biggest I'm, question. I'm starting to get a lot of that as well. Yeah. And I don't teach field craft or survival. Yeah. What do, what do we do? Mike, what do we do right now? You're saying get off the bench. And it's like the same ideology behind people who say, you got to have a better mindset. And, and so my sergeant major brain is like, what the fuck does this mean? Like, why are you saying that? Give me tangible takeaways, literal things that I could do. And so I, I try to map that out. And for me, it was a problem, which is, you know, our brains work and we try, like, like to fix problems. So I'm like, what the fuck do we do? Well, one, I want to instill confidence in people. And I said to Kevin, I said, listen, we have to start something. I don't even give a fuck if it's just a philosophical movement that gives people some tools. Let's start something. And when I started it, Kevin Owens actually named it. I'm like, it's American something. And he's like, Contend what about contingencies? We always do contingencies and primary, alternate, contingency and emergency plans, pace plans. I'm like, American contingency. And we, we fucking named it. And then we put it out. And I didn't realize how many people were really scared 
and and really looking for answers until we released it and and got droves of people coming into the fold. Hmm. We're like, fuck, we're we're invested. We want to get involved. So it, I will say this, and and this is how it started off wrong, is people immediately thought Mike Glover, former special operations guy, he's starting, starting a militia. A fucking militia. I had tweets, um, I had articles, which were all fa- false and fake. I had people writing news stories on me saying a former special operations CIA, CIA uh, contractor is starting a fucking right-wing militia, which anybody who fucking knows me know. I mean, dude, uh, I've never openly say this. Like, I, I like weed. You know why I like weed? In gummy form? Because it helps me sleep. And it's Same. better than fucking, uh, what is it called? Uh, the Meth. Shit. Yeah, cocaine, <laughs> heroin, ambient, <laughs> ambient, close. <laughs> but it's it's better than all that shit. Do you that, know what's better than ambient? Anything. Anything is better. Than that, that shit is so addictive, dude. I was taking one. You, you know this because you're in special operations. That's what they gave us, dude. To they had put two. Us down. We had two bowls. Yeah, Adderall, had, ambient. Yeah, and it was we we had the shit before the Adderall where you thought your hair was gonna fucking light on fire and you're yeah. like, I do want to charge a fifty yes. cal nest. Yeah, and then you have an ulcer and your stomach hurts for days and you lay in bed yeah. exhausted and but you can't like, sleep. Yeah, and you're just like, ah. You're puking. Do heavy, you know, are, are sad thoughts, do they weigh more than happy thoughts? So you're just sitting there fucking losing your mind. So what do you do? Ambient bowl, completely unregulated. And yeah. when it gets low, the doctor's just like, shh. Dump it in there. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. Con- and that was the constant cycle. Yeah. I would rather, I mean, so, uh, Kill Cliff, dude, the CBD stuff. I love it. I am so I'm anti a, putting yeah. a pill into my mouth based off of, I could go to the Corman and be like, I have a headache, bag of 800 milligram Motrins. Yep. I just sawed my hand off by accident, bag of 800 milligram Motrins. Yep. I have cancer, bag, well, then that was probably a stretch, but and also probably the hand is a stretch too. But <laughs> let's just say they will give you, you know, they they just gave me so many pills and I, I did go down a journey in a rabbit hole with pills after I got hurt, but I hate that shit. I do too. I would rather take a weed gummy any day of the week Absolutely. than an Ambien. 100, I'm a big advocate. Well, I, I don't think I have been an advocate. I've been talking about it and- and I've never openly said this on a podcast, but I'll say it now, is is I am an advocate for, number one, anything CBD related. Yeah. That's, that's, that's good CBD. Like on Canna, which I'm, 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 uh, I know the guy who started the company who's a former ranger, and he puts the right filtered doses of CBD, the yep. cannabinoid receptors that are going to affect change and help help you. And also a big fan of Kiwi, uh, the Kill Cliff CBD drink. I can't even keep them in stock because all my guys are crushing. Them. I just give them away. I yeah, mean, and I love them. I they love them. and people will ask me all the time. Does it make a difference? I feel it physiologically. I do feel it. And so I have uh, like I've messed around with all of it, like the solves and the cream and some of them don't work great. Yeah. And I found stuff where like I'll get banged up at jujitsu and I'll rub it on there. And it's like two minutes. Gone. I feel so much better and it's localized to that one place. I'm not having to ingest pill after pill after pill and then I need to eat because I was going to feel like I was going to throw up and then I like, wow, I guess I do just ship blood all the time because, <laughs> you know, uh, 2,400 milligrams of Motrin a day apparently yeah. is not good for you. Dude, it's life changing. Life changing. It is life changing. I give that yeah. stuff away as fast as I can because people will ask, does it work? Like, dude, it fucking works. And yeah. I feel it more, like I, I will take uh, or drink the... I drink the drinks more often because it's convenient. I just throw them in my truck. But it, it helps me with like stress relief. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I don't understand yeah. the mechanism by with, w- by which it works, but I notice a difference in my life. The The first time I realized Ambien was a problem was um, in Northern California when I woke up in my bed naked with dirt and mud inside the sheets with me. Oh, you went on a vision quest. Dude, I, I went on the vision quest. I tried <laughs> to find the vision quest naked in my Jeep. I, I found it in a ditch. My uh, girlfriend at the time drug my ass out, and and God bless her heart, like like we went through some shit together. Um, but I was transitioned out of the military, was all fucked up, was taking Ambien, drinking whiskey, trying to go to bed. It's a classic pairing. That's yeah, you can't slice a lime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like elk and red wine go together. God. Ambien and whiskey is not the good combo for pairing. Dude, fucking. have you ever done the Ambien Olympics? Which one's that? Oh, tell me about it because I might have done it, but called it something else. <sighs> come back off of, uh, you know, sun's coming up. You come back, you yep. de-jock. Episode of 24 goes in. Everybody takes an Ambien. Mm-hmm. If you're awake at the end of the episode, everybody takes another Ambien, and you continue until there's only one man standing. Yes, I've okay. done that. Don't yeah. ever do this for anybody who's listening, 
but that's what we used to do at the highest levels of special operations. So take whatever you thought we were and then realize we're a bunch of fucking <laughs> monkeys because that's what we would do. And we I don't would. advise anybody would do that. Would. And you'll find people passed out like face down naked on gravel the next morning, not knowing how they got there. 100%. We used to do, I did a, a sniper stay behind missions for in Iraq. So they, we would infill at night, yep. occupy during the day, watch and observe the guys that we were going after for, from across the street or whatever. And we would be in that house. I would take, it wasn't the Adderall. You're right. It was like the shit that fighter pilots got. Yeah. And I can't remember the name of it, but goddamn, Dude. about 30 minutes later, your skin's tingling. I, you, here's what I realized it was a problem, but like I enjoyed it. When I was staring out of a window, pulling security and enjoyed doing so. Like for hours and fucking like 10 hours later, I'm like, this is fucking amazing. Like I love, I love pulling security and staring at the fucking ground. Like my brain. And then you come back from that. So exhausted. Yeah, you, you age take, about seven years. Every dude, time you take fuck, one of those pills, you, it would fuck people up. We yeah. had guys. The problem is in combat, you do those kind of rotations and then you rip out of it and then you go back into a, a normal cycle and have fun with that transition. You, it's fucking brutal. And so you get back on the train. I, I, I was able to break it more than most because I didn't really have an addictive personality. I never have. But when I got out of the military, I'm like, I can't sleep. The, the VA gave me trazodone, which is a... Um, it's not like a horse tranquilizer? Dude, it fucking might as well have been. It, it, made me, it made me feel like a fucking zombie. If I, if I wasn't trazodone right now, I'd be sleeping under the fucking table. <laughs> and, and it's supposed to help you... Uh, with anxiety, but it's supposed to help you sleep. And they would do Ambien, Trazodone, and they would give you both. They would give you both. How do you even survive that? You barely do, and people and people don't. And then with alcohol, if and it fucking wrecks your life. Yeah. Um, I took uh, Indica is the one that makes you sleepy. Okay. And there's Sativa that keeps you awake. And there's now it's smart because they do different strains of it. For the first time ever in my life, because I was anti wheat, dude. I was the guy in technical community college because this is uh, that was my college outside of military college that I went to, where I I argued with kids like you fucking loser, you fucking <laughs> weed head, you don't understand. And and looking back on them, I'm like what the fuck? Like I wish every I wish every member of special operations was allowed to smoke weed because I know when they came back from home and they were all fucked up and they were showing it in anger. And, and, and emotional breakdowns and they hit a fucking joint or they ate a gummy they would go holy fuck it's not so bad yeah it would round the corner substantially yeah and they would when i slept for the first time in my life i realized what sleep was and how important it was and that, and i wasn't hooked because of the, of because of the drug i was hooked because of the result yeah and so i'm a big proponent of it man i know we sidetracked there but I fucking like weed. I'm a big... Be if, if, careful with the quantity that you consume, people. So, yeah. You want to talk about stories you never talked about? Okay. I've had a few gummy incidents in my life. And I can tell the story. Unfortunately, the other person involved in the story has since passed away. But I was in Switzerland, base jumping. And uh, we were out having come some uh, steak frites, steak and french fries. Mm. And it was the end of the trip, and we'd been hiking our asses off. And it just, at the end of the evening... My buddy was like, hey, man, he had some jelly slices. Ooh. And I was like, dude, I just want to get a good night's sleep. Because he was leaving the next day. I was there for like the next two days. He's like, here, have some of this. I'm like, cool. And I ate it. And like 30 minutes later, I'm like, dude, that didn't do shit. Give me another one of those. That, that's the word. That's right there. He, he's like, uh, you probably don't want to do that. I was like, shut up, dude. First off, I am the I boss like, of you in every fucking way. Whatever you take, give me three times that. <laughs> So he gave me another one, and we walked over to a restaurant. We were sharing a bottle of wine and having literally steak for eat, steak and fries. And I remember I took a sip of wine, delightful, like Pinot, mm. like a nice red, chewing some food, and I take another sip of wine, and it tastes completely and utterly different than the sip I had just taken. We're talking maybe Fuck. a 60-second separation. And then the world is just like... And I remember what I thought was only like... Five seconds, my buddy Alex was across the table, fucking in tears, dying, <laughs> laughing. And I remember looking up and I'm like, What are you laughing at? He was just like, You, you're fucked up right now, aren't you? Oh. I could barely walk back to where we were staying. I was having like a full on psychedelic, what it seemed like skin tingling. I got stuck on that ride for 48 hours. Ooh, I, and that's the thing. That's why I say be careful. I don't have a lot of experience with that. But what I do have experience with is getting stuck on a fucking train ride that I couldn't get off. 
Ooh. And it got miserable. <laughs> I, I had one of those for 12 hours, and it fucked me up. Dude. It fucked me up. You're, you're in a prison of your fucking mind. Yeah. Have you ever heard of... Uh, I've, this is interesting. You ever heard of the fucking K-hole? Not, not anything sexual. Ketamine? Ketamine. The ketamine. Uh, I've, you know what? I have heard that term, but I have absolutely zero experience with anything like that. You've never done any ketamine? No. So um, I had shrapnel in my fucking face. And, well, because uh, it's a painkiller, right? Like it, an incredibly powerful, it's like a, more powerful than morphine or any of those opiates, right? It's, it's, well, it can be just as powerful, but I think the... The reason doctors use ketamine, and this is not from my doctorly worldly experience, but people telling me, is that ketamine, um, when you kill the pain, you kill the memory associated with the pain. So it numbs the, the really? associative factor. So most people who take ketamine, it knocks them unconscious, and so they don't. there's no association, so they don't freak out, they don't lose their shit, and then when they reflect back on the pain, there's not the association of the pain. Interesting. Uh, so... Um, Never had done ketamine or any fucking thing recreationally, and 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 I don't recommend ever doing it. I was in a hospital when this happened. I had facial cellulitis, and uh, I had shrapnel in my face, and it, a piece was working itself out of my fucking nostril, and it turned into an orb, which manifests itself into an infection, and I had facial cellulitis. This is over the course of is fucking- Is that like just like a massive bump on your dude, face? Well, no, it was it was like my face was like, you know how cellulitis, you push the skin? Yeah. And there's no cali- ca- capillary response? Yeah, just you- It's the, like dead? Indentation, yeah. It, my face was like that. And it was fucking ma- scary. I would have made fun of you so bad. Dude, it was fucking horrible. Like your face is fucking Look at you, my dead face. face. <laughs> you dead face fucker. <laughs> Wearing that dead face mask. I don't need a mask now on COVID. Yeah. It was all fucked up. And so I went th- to the doctor and <laughs> I never had any psychedelic experiences. I'm a big fan of everything that that way now because I think creativity is like the it's like the ocean. We haven't really tapped into that especially in our minds. And so I'm 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 sitting there in the hospital and they go, "Hey, we're going to lance this. We're going to we're going to cut it from the inside of your cheek and then we're going to try to push the infection out." And I'm like, "Well, that's scary as fuck. That's and gross." But let's do this shit. Let's talk about what you're going to do for me, Doc. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's lay out what my options here. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Which is, this is in Amador County. This is Nor- Nor- NorCal. And the guy's like, have you ever done ketamine? And I said, I haven't, but I have experience working with ketamine. Like in in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, yeah. our docs always used ketamine on indige, on people f- for wounds. And it's it's classic in veterinary uh, things because of the fucking oh, animals. It? Okay. Yeah, it's 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 mainly used for uh, for animals. And I said no, but I I can because I'm not a fan of morphine. It makes me itch and shit, and I just don't feel well. He goes, okay, I'm gonna get the doc from upstairs. There's two docs in the hospital. I'm gonna get him to come down, and we're gonna put we're gonna use ketamine instead of morphine. So this guy comes down, and he's of Arab descent. And I say this for a point in the story later. And he's Middle Eastern. He's got a big beard. And I, I look at him and I'm and I'm like okay and they have me on something already it's like a fucking like maybe a bump of morphine so I'm I'm taken down a level maybe even a volume or something like that and he gets set up and he walks into the room he's like what am I doing I'm like oh you're the only person in the hospital who could administer basically paraphrasing who could administer ketamine so you're gonna get this and the nurse hands him a syringe of ketamine and it looks like a lot a shit ton but he goes over. And he goes to my IV line and he sticks it in. He goes, okay, just let me know. And this is happening fast. And I look at the doctor who's talking to me. He goes, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start out. And he turns back at the doctor who's administering the ketamine. And the guy pushes the whole <laughs> fucking syringe. <laughs> like he literally like jams it. And the doc, the guy looks back at him. And, and the guy looks at him and he goes, was I supposed to? And he goes, did you just? And there's this moment of like, they're looking at each other like, oh, fuck. They look at the nurses, and the nurse is like, what the fuck? And, they, and then I fucking transport my, <laughs> into a fucking another universe. Dude, I swear to God. It was like, I went, what the fuck is going? And he just, it, I, I straight into orbit on one of Elon Musk's dude, uh, rockets. Dude, it, it was the most, here, here's what I would say about this. Outside of the most traumatic experiences in war, this trumps every one of those experiences by ten, tenfold. I was in a fucking world where my head was on a fucking roller coaster. And it's just, a, it's not a passive, like a, this is a dream and I got segment. I'm immersed in this fucking world. Like I remember it all. My head's on a roller coaster and I'm floating around on this roller coaster through space and time. 
and I'm interacting with people. And through this, the, the course of this interaction, I come to the conclusion that I have no communication with my body. I'm just a fucking floating orb <laughs> that is a cartoon head <laughs> that looks like fucking family guy. And, and I, I, not only do I realize this, but I come to terms with it. And I come to terms with the existence that I'm going to live as a fucking head on a roller coaster, but it's going to be cool because everybody here is cool. I feel good. <laughs> We're fucking living this life. And then as I'm transporting through this roller coaster, all of a sudden I hit, you know, on the tracks on a roller coaster when it comes to an end to yeah. break you, it goes. Ju -ju 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 -ju. Yep. All of a sudden it's going Ju -ju 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 -ju. and my head's fucking coming on this, uh, on this, uh, cart and I'm looking around and I'm confused because the ride's kind of over. And all of a sudden I feel like my body reconnecting with my brain. And I kind of come out of it a little bit and I re and I, uh, my eyes wake up and I, I start seeing shit and my, in my right hand, I have the person who's in the fucking, um, stretcher in the hospital that's between a curtain and me. I fucking reach over and grab her fucking, uh, it's like the armrest thing and rip her towards me. <laughs> then the, I, all I remember is like the nurse is pinning me to the fucking ground. I look up and the, the, uh, the fucking Arab doctor, poor, I'm sorry about this. I'm not fucking racist, <laughs> but he looks at me and I'm like, you fucking Haji beard. I'm like yelling Haji beard in the middle of this <laughs> thing. He's in shock. The nurses are in shock. I'm fucking screaming. And I look over and my ex-girlfriend is recording the whole fucking thing on yes. a camera. She just got it. She's like filming the shit and I'm freaking losing it and I'm coming out of it and it, it starts to come back and then I realized I was out and I look at my uh, ex-girlfriend and I'm like, what the fuck happened? She goes, you fucking lot, like your eyes were rolled to the back of the, your head the whole time. I was like, wait a minute, what do you mean rolled to the back of my head? Like I must've been out for like a day. Like what the fuck? You were out for 10 minutes, 10 fucking minutes. It, it felt like an, a lifetime, like I lived an entire lifetime in this conscious state. So I'm like, what the fuck just happened? Holy fuck. I go through this and I start doing research on the K-hole. And apparently everybody who experiences this does experiences the same kind of cartoony visual feel uh, becoming disassociated with their physical body and has this life altering experience. And I fucking had it. And it was all trauma. It was all... I mean, some people have a good experience. My experience wasn't bad, but it was significant. And then I realized, man, there is another portal inward that I have have not even fucking begin to understand. And I, that's why I'm fascinated by the whole fucking. I mean, I, I, I was going to supposed to go to not Costa Rica, ayahuasca probably, or the ayahuasca yeah. thing down in South America, or ibogaine or whatever they give you. Yeah, I was supposed to do that. Um, I had hard pass on that because I had to pay my own fucking travel. I'm fucking there. terrified of that shit, man. Yeah. Somebody described yeah. it, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but they basically said, you know, when it comes to psychedelics, the people who uh, should or are considering using psychedelics, be prepared to give the anchor chain of reality a tug. <laughs> and don't go down that route unless you're prepared to do so. Yeah. I totally fucked that up, but it kind of Would makes you sense. ever do it in a controlled <sighs> setting? It'd have to be super controlled, right? It would have to be super controlled for me. I am willing to give the anchor chain of reality a tug because I want to learn more about myself. That's the reason that I would do it. I'm not interested in having an experience that isn't meaningful or that doesn't provide me more insight into who I am as a person. Yeah. I Be think that's the benefit of it. Yeah. You know, I, I having I, said that fucking yeah. terrified of it. Yeah. I, I, when I, when I was started, like I got started getting into mushrooms and, and understanding like mycelium and, and, um, DMT and all these things, um, I, I tripped mushrooms and I've never tripped mushrooms before. And the only interest for me was healing, mm -hmm. you know, healing, which they say it literally does. If you talk to the doctor, like at a cellular level, at, at a cellular level, like the synapsis, that scar, I think it's called myelin, but it's like the scar tissue that creates memories. It's, and I say scar tissue, uh, trying to visualize it. It's not literally that, yep. but it creates this portal. What, what the psilocybin does is it, creates new neural networks that redefine so it's the idea like and i i'm not a big ied trauma guy i've never seen like i've been ied before and it was ca uh, catastrophic but it didn't fuck me up yeah so i'm driving uh, you're driving down a road and you see a bag and the bag reminds you of an id 
and then you go into a you know your what is it adrenal gland, adrenal glands and your uh, I'm not sure the mechanism but I know what you're describing yeah fight or flight basically yeah. hypothalamus activates cortisol and it floods through your fucking system and you fucking react that is caused by a memory that is triggering that endocrine neurological response right that physiological response so I see the bag I go oh fuck and then I go into fight or flight or freeze so what this literally does and this is just at the education that I got on it is it creates another pathway around that so when you see that you go oh there's a fucking bag on the side of the road and then you and then you move on with your life instead of transporting back to the experience yeah, because before. you're you're triggering memories that are associated with physical conditions in the real world that you experience which is the whole means behind memories in the first place to remind you uh, and trigger your bo physical body to allow you to survive in primal or ancestral kind of conditions oh shit there's a fucking tiger now i need to change the physical composition of my body to survive so if I didn't have that association, I'd see a tiger and go, oh, a fucking pet hey, tiger. kitty. Come here, kitty, kitty, kitty. <laughs> it's like the lady's letting in the raccoon. She thinks it's her fucking cat. She's oh, letting God. it inside. Yeah. So uh, it creates that pathway. But when I fucking trip mushrooms, I'm not a big Native American. I have Native American in me. Very small percentage of it. I don't even know where the fuck it comes from. It's like four to six generations away. And when I fucking trip mushrooms, I went into another portal of, of my mind I fucking saw, I hadn't watched a cowboy movie in fucking years. I saw Native American Indians in full warrior uh, kit running in full gallop with fucking streaming falcon eagles faces pushing through space in front of them. Mind-boggling. Where I, I went straight there, didn't even research that there was this a common experience shared by people who trip psilocybin. But it was all like I was a fucking Native American Indian. Huh. It was, dude, and I was in a residential home in a comfy bed, and there wasn't any kind of that uh, material or thought inside of my head. I was like, I want to go into this state and fucking see if I can heal some shit. And all of a sudden, I'm transported to fucking, a fucking cowboy and Indians movie. And But it was profoundly impactful because I realized, dude, you're not fucking... What you perceive is not the reality that you tangibly live it's inside and 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 it made me feel better about life like i woke up i remember coming out of it and telling uh uh telling my family and my friends like dude that fucking was impactful and not only was it impactful but i want to do it again and i, I don't want to do it like tomorrow yeah but i want to do it routinely as a meaningful hygiene. enough experience yeah the mental health mental hygiene aspect of that you got to trip you got to do it man never tried it the the best way to do it is um, they you can get mushrooms and and chocolate um, from legal sources because there's a lot of places in the United States now I think Denver Portland or there's cities in states that have legalized it yeah it comes out of the fucking earth the fact that it's illegal is kind of fucking bizarre to me but it's uh, it's controlled but not there it's legal to use and you take you microdose it. And what I've, what I've also, I can't believe I'm fucking admitting all this shit. What's in this kill clip? <laughs> this is the recovery one. <laughs> oh my fuck. So now you, you microdose it. And what microdosing does, at least for me, is it increases the blood flow to my fucking head. Like I, I feel, it feels like Adderall. In a weird sense, it's not like Adderall, but it feels like you're on like an upper, but without the upper down you're like you don't have to shit your pants you don't feel like jittery and that's the tough one to describe to people about the uppers they gave us the downside was a fucking trap door that was substantially worse than the up <sighs> horrible right oh, it put me on my fucking ass for 48 hours how did you how did you cycle because you live that life and you and you do those those rotations how did you cycle away from that i would stop trying to take the ambient about two weeks before coming home and force myself through those really rough three to five days where you can't sleep because that shit's addictive it is it, addictive as fuck and i would try to get home on a normal sleep cycle and and uh it was tough are you a good sleeper now yeah off and on i'm off and on too yeah it's either pretty good sleep or i am if my brain does a revolution on a topic, I'm fucked. If you try, my my brain's the same way. If I if I get up to piss in the middle of the night, yeah, and if I have a like a one thought, thought right, a one full revolution of like, hey, I need to do this task. Don't forget to do this task. I'm fucked. Like, Fuck. 
That's all you'd be thinking about. Correct. Yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah. I, I have to almost pretend to be a dummy. Like, I'm like, um, I'm so tired. I'm fucking dumb and going to sleep. <laughs> and then I'm like, but there's that one fucking thing you haven't done. I know. And then it's done. Which reminds you of another one, and then you're planning out your entire yeah. day. And then I'm sitting there looking at the ceiling, going through analytical thoughts at two in the morning. So yeah. I don't sleep well. I don't either. I don't think I've ever... <sighs> have I ever slept well? It's, well, I, th- I think I slept fine when I was in high school and shit yeah. like that. But I can't remember a time where I've had a consistent period of my life, even for like a week, where I'd wake up and like, this is amazing. Yeah. Most- have you ever tried the devices? Like the Aurora? I just ordered that Aurora ring. It's the ring that no. monitors your vitals. Uh, a buddy, not a buddy of mine, he's an associate of mine. Um, um, I'm, I hope to have him on a podcast soon. His name is Jeff Wu. He's a big biohacker. But that ring, it was supposed to be really accurate. So it basically gives you some insight into what your body's got going on. Yeah, it, it. I think a lot of it has to do with physical movement. So when you're moving and you're shifting, which I do constantly, yeah, um, it, it it tracks your sleep that way, and then gives you feedback, and then gives you windows. Like for some reason, like today, I got up at four in the morning. And Jock, I, Jock would be proud. Yeah, <laughs> I, I took a picture of my. <laughs> see, I don't post my pictures. I I, I wake up at three fifty. Yeah, but I don't post. It's a secret closed account. Yeah, I'm yeah. three forty nine, but it's fine. Yeah, we don't. I don't like to brag. I don't like to hashtag <laughs> that. Um, but when I when I woke up, I think it was four seventeen. I stayed up, but if I go back to bed at six thirty or seven, there's this magic window where I'm nauseous because I can't. I'm so freaking fatigued and tired. That if I sleep from like six thirty to seven thirty, or even six thirty to seven, it feels like I got ten hours of sleep. Really? Because I'm so fucking burned out and exhausted. I don't know what it is. <sighs> it's that we're fucked up. It's we're fucking horrible. <laughs> so we have to go back. Explain to me why you started American <laughs> Was, Contingency. <laughs> that has to be the longest digression, and you and fucking. I don't even know history. how we went down that path, but I'm glad that we did. That was that's fucking insane. I'm um, sorry about that. Stop looking at your Instagram butt pics. I know. I'm so, I'm fucking, <laughs> fuck. They're yoga pics. Yeah. Um, American contingency. Wow. <laughs> so we got to the naming convention. Yeah. And the, then people reaching out to you saying, "Hey, what do you want to do? Yeah. Or so, what should we do? I should say. Well, so we the way it lined out is I I did well. Here's the biggest problem with all this. How the fuck do you do that? Anything without being suppressed? Because when I when I thought about it even on my own account and talking about it in live feeds, they were getting taken down. Instagram right now- I wonder now, what the mechanism is for that. Is that people complaining or do they have an algorithm? It's it's both. Okay. It's, it, it has to do with keywords and phrases. It even has to do with uh, well, it's complaints. And what I think I have is a- Well, re- I report your posts every time. I know, me too. I immediately it, click on your shit yeah. and be like, this man's racist. I've been giving you one stars on your podcast. I do zero. <laughs> But it hasn't been changing the, the, yeah. the stats. You're getting bigger and better and <laughs> you got more ratings. I'm just helping you out there. Yeah. It, it, um, it, it does have to do with that. And I realized... Well, it's not going to help either if you early on get uh, branded externally as a fringe organization, militia, right wing, the combination of those two. None of those are going to help either. I'm sure those algorithms are looking for shit like that. F- like Facebook deleted... Um, not only Antifa accounts, but every single, I think they're called three percenters, the three percenter groups, the right wing, gotcha. the Patriot groups, they deleted them all. I mean, thousands of them. I, I even had some of them contact me like, how can we reallocate our guys? We want to get involved. So when when I looked at this from a kind, of, kind of a business mind and perspective and how to affect the most people, I realized that I couldn't put it on any social media platform. I did. I put it on Instagram until it is going to be suppressed. Eventually, it will be suppressed. But I wanted to have a contingency set up to where people can go outside of the main social media platforms to be able to find us. So a buddy of mine, Will Harbin, big shout out to Will and uh, and Georgia. He's a video game company guy. Um, bought, sold, traded, did a whole bunch of shit with companies. He goes, hey, you should use a company called Locals. And I'm like, bro, I'm not going to use fucking Locals. Because Locals sounds Locals like... like- you're a local L O C A L S. Yeah, it's okay. like a, it's like a fucking. I thought it was a fucking dating app. It's like Farmers.com. Yeah, f- 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 Farmers That's Only. Of, yeah, damn it, FarmersOnly.com. Yeah, I got to take my profile down. I'm not getting a lot of spam. <laughs> your shirt today, though, dude. Fuck, you'd be, dude. I'd put boots? that as your profile. Have picture. you seen these fucking 
these oh, I almost blew my Those shit kickers, dude. No. Let's, let's work on our hamstring flexibility dude, here, okay? You don't even want to know. My <laughs> fucking hamstrings are all fucked up. I need to get in that, that fucking gym over there. Oh, yeah. I'm doing. Do uh, involuntary yoga yeah. or folding clothes with people still in it? Is it? Yeah, that's the best <laughs> That's the best kind. Is that open still? You guys are still open, right? Yes. Can I even say that on the. Sure. It's so Montana. there's no restrictions. Um. I don't know the exact phase that we are in in Montana, but uh, so Travis and Kisa are the owners there, and they actually proactively shut down very early. Yeah, um, and and I, they were right to do so. I think both from a medical and a social optic perspective. Yes, I have been able to train the entire time, but I also take it upon myself, my own health, safety, and security, the things that we're talking about. So a small group of us who managed our social contacts would meet and we would still train awesome. and accept the risk of that. And we were really honest though, if we were traveling, who we were hanging out with, but where we are is geographically remote. I mean, Montana is a socially distant state. I love that. Yeah, by I topography and geography. So I have been able to keep training, but they have phased back in uh, based on the guidelines that have come through. So it is open now, yes. I love it, man. Um, so he, he hits me up and he says, you should be on this platform. I'm thinking it's a dating platform, so kind of blow them off. And I'm looking for platforms. My my idea was I'll just crowdsource this shit and I'll I'll start my own app. That is until I realized how much fucking apps cost millions, like millions of dollars for a good one. For yeah. a good one, you I mean you could go on and make your own fucking Google app and it's a bag of shit. Don't do that, Mike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and the and the worst thing about that is when you when you start looking at something like this, which is harvesting social contacts, it's completely and utterly. Um, uh, potentially exploitable by shitheads. Of course. And, and most people don't think about that. So I, security is on my mind. Um, where I put them on a platform is on my mind and then not being suppressed. So I eventually reach out to the uh, a guy named Ari who's who's the CEO of Locals. He's also a co-founder. And he's a former Israeli defense officer. Interesting. Uh, American. And he's like, hey, man, Listen, I know secure and Israelis know security more than any, anybody. And he's like, I, I know what you're talking about. And here's let me lay it out for you. And he lays out the groundwork for for the server. He goes, we will never suppress you. We are not in the business of suppression. That's why we started locals, because we want to have people on the platform who know that if they want to moderate, they'll moderate themselves, which is another fucking ball of wax. So he gave me the confidence that I could potentially push everybody to locals. So I start that movement. Well, the problem with, and not the problem, I think it's actually the benefit of locals, is that it's a subscription-based model, just like all these platforms. How the fuck are you supposed to build the server, maintain the server? For free. And it, do it for free. So I, we started looking at it, and I go, well, here, we'll do a free version of it, which is American contingency that does open source Intel. I got 22 analysts who are OGA guys that open source gather information and then reallocate it and disseminate it for geographical regions. They'll say, hey, there's a protest in your area, in this vicinity, on this hour, on this date, stay the fuck away. Yeah. And so they do that for free on AmericanContingency.com. And there's a paid slot, and I'm like, I'm not gonna charge people a lot of fucking money, so what's the minimum? It's five bucks. So the minimum is $5 a month. And in that fold, it allows us to start vetting people which means I do a background investigation on you. I verify you are who you say you are, and you're not a shithead. Even if you're a shithead, as long as you didn't touch a child, I'm okay with that. So I support the death penalty for pedophiles. What? what I support like fucking like torture and fucking. Oh, well, I should. Well, I didn't. Yeah. Well, no, I was going to say that. Yeah. I didn't say yeah. how they were going to die. Yeah, we should be burning those motherfuckers <laughs> to the ground. Yeah. The sex offender app, which is a. a to me, a DF tool, a directionally finding fucking tool should like, if you're going to go out and kill yourself, this is like, you should, I, I want to advocate for you to not do that, but all these people are fucking wasting their lives. There's plenty. I shouldn't even say this on a podcast. <laughs> I think this is my inside voice coming out, <laughs> but you get on a sex offender app. You could fucking find shitheads in your backyard by a red pin. You don't, you, you don't even want to look at that in Florida, by the way. I have looked at that, and I look. I will at least take a look at it anytime that I've looked at moving. Yeah. And all I will say to people is, you should go take a look, and you'll probably be utterly shocked. It's fucking scary, isn't it? The number of red pins is very, very high. It looks like a cancer. Correct. And and more, more so if you click on the red pin, it shows you the dude's face. And if you look at these fucking people, you're like, wow, 
wow. I don't mean to stereotype, but you fucking look like a sex offender. Not you, but like the fucking guy on the app. Yeah. It's fucking insane. Yeah. Anyways, we digress again. We do, but it's, it's fine. It's American fine. contingency. Pay, yeah. Paywall. So so there's the, the paywall, which my, my thinking also too is, uh, we had people complain. They're like, like we just hosted $20,000 worth of training in South Carolina at the sawmill. It's actually going on today. September 11th, 12th, and 13th for 300 people. From all from lo- from uh, AmericanContingency.locals.com, so they're members, and they got uh, training from mostly SEALs, five Navy SEALs, three GRS buddies, a couple SF guys, who are teaching them self defense, situation awareness, not just tactics, but how to think. Yeah, you know, um, and their families there. There's people who are there with their children. Um, there's there's husband and wives training together, and. And there's people complaining, saying $5. It's like, fuck, dude. You could pay $5 for a fucking energy drink in a gas station, but you're fucking complaining about getting free information and free training via an apparatus that brings people together. So I thought, how is this gonna, how am I going to navigate this world, um, and, and what does it look like evolving? Well, one, it is a means to educate people. So it's a training apparatus. That's online training, offline training, physical training, mindset training. Also, teaching people how to lead in their own communities. When I did my first American contingency meet, it was in Oregon. And maybe 50, 75 people showed up. It was a small group because we were restricted by the the community center that allowed us to do it. And the sentiment was the same. They're scared. They don't know what to do. They don't know what the start point is. So people just need guidance. And I want to run this like how an effective, efficient government should work, where I give you the promise that I'm going to give you left and right limits. I'm going to create some construct of law and order, which is saying, hey, you can't be a scumbag and be on this app. You can't be you can't be a troll and talk shit and be negative and toxic because I'll just block and fucking delete you. I'll give you your fucking five dollars back and then give you education where you could do what you need to do in your own communities to lead on your own because the dictatorship the hierarchy that the, I'm going to be the sergeant major, you're going to be the team leaders, that will fucking never work because people have their own incentives, their own agendas, and it will fucking fail. So I'm, I'm saying, look, I'm not, I'm not, Sergeant Major Glover is not flying out to you and fucking QRFing you. But what you could do is look in your own communities. You could look at the construct of the way you're organized, families, friends, whatever that might look like, and you can come together as a community and stand up in your churches, stand up in your workplaces and say, hey, maybe we should do something together and come together as a community to protect ourselves and not just man-made disaster. We're not talking about fucking riots. The bigger scheme of maneuver here is we're talking about what's going on right now with the displacement of human beings and the wildfires in Oregon and, and California. Dude, did you hear about the National Guard 47 pilots who just came in? Yeah. I, I, how they took off with, again. Were SOAR guys? Were those uh, 160th guys? I don't I, think they were. And they might have actually been 46s instead of 47s, but I'm amazed they, they could. They thin, yeah. I'm amazed they could take off with their balls weighing <sighs> them down. Un- they, fucking believable. I, I basically, from what I heard, Cal Fire was like, listen, we can't get to you. It was like 200 people. Yeah. The National Guard. You're said, just going to fucking die. And the National Guard was like, hold my fucking beer. And just a dun 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 And just in, in launching people out of black there. Black the fuck, fuck out. Yes. And fucking rescued those people. You see some of those pictures from the cockpit too? Like shit is just ablaze everywhere. Insane, man. And the guy's just like. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. I hope he has a fucking handlebar mustache. I know. That would be badass. With the Raleigh just, fingers oh, twist. Oh, fuck yeah, dude. Yeah. Like an ivory handled pipe. I fucking love that, man. <laughs> it, it, I, I really. That, that is the thing too. Yeah. Be, and. Uh, this is another one that I try to tell people. You can avoid the riots and protests largely, unless, you know, again, Tim was talking about the Uber driver who got put in the wrong direction. He got fucked, right? In Austin. He yeah. ended up shooting the guy who pointed an AK did, at him. Yeah. But guess what? If you point an AK at me, I'm going to shoot you too. That's happens. That's a mathematical formula in my mind. There's no emotion in that. Yep. That is one plus one equals two yep. shots to your face. Yep. Um, but mostly, it's completely and utterly avoidable. You don't have to go strap a gun on and come down to Kalispell to, they were like, oh, we're protecting the Veterans Monument. It's like, yeah, I don't know if it was really at risk. You don't yeah. have to do that shit. Yeah. But you have probably no choice. If a while, I mean, look where I live too. Like, or you were at my house the last time. There is a damn good chance. Well, not a damn good chance, but I have a better chance of being involved 
in an environmental situation than I ever will because I'm not going to go to a riot. I'm not yeah. going to go to a. Pro- I'm going to remove myself from that. There are so many more threats other than what you just see on the news. Yeah, I, I what I people should understand, even though it seems like the world's falling apart, the world when it comes to natural disasters is literally falling apart. Yeah, we we are consumed constantly. What <laughs> in the news cycle because you haven't seen it. There's been a catastrophic windstorm, uh, a, a, a cyclone, um, a hurricane, numerous tornadoes. Wasn't there like a double hurricane yeah, in Texas? There was like- two, two storm surges caused by two back-to-back tropical storms that, <laughs> that hit the, the country. There was two, there's major wildfires that are making historic um, references right now in the history books. It's the biggest uh, Cal Fire circumstance they've ever dealt with in history. Oregon's following that same suit. It's since 2015 was the the highest spike of wildfires. They will beat that this year. The the mayor just blamed, or the governor just blamed it on uh, climate control. Which I thought was comical. I'm like, I saw that too. Jesus, fuck. Dude. Let's not even go down. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> but but what I want people to understand is American contingency is about looking at yourself and realizing that you need to be your own first response. You have to take your life into your own hands and the lives of your families. If you're waiting for governments, if you're waiting for institutions to come bail your ass out, then you're going to fucking potentially risk your life. And that's not okay. The The evolution of this, uh, the last component is be prepared, but the evolution of this is I want people to be able to help each other understanding they're, they're also in the American contingency pipeline. So it's just a better way of looking at you as being vetted, right? If I show up on scene, I got an American contingency shirt, sticker, ID card, whatever the fuck it is, and you're an American contingency guy, we have a commonality or a common bond and at least establish SOPs. We know, hey, we know what first aid and trauma is, you know, and, and it's generalized. I don't, I don't mean we know how to shoot, move, and communicate together. Yeah. I just mean we're on the same sheet of fucking music. So when, when shit does hit the fan, and we're able to logistically, which requires funds. That's why uh, I'm excited that it is a, a, a revenue stream because we're able to do the training on the East Coast. We're doing it in Dallas, Fort Worth. We're doing it in Sirius, Sirius, California. We're doing it in Goldendale, Washington. These mass events where we could help train that one day we could mobilize and help each other. And I don't even give a fuck. If there's nothing going on, we'll go to the fucking homeless and try to take 10 homeless people off the streets and and have counselors, psychologists, and people there to help them see if we can get them off the fucking streets. We are surrounded by natural man-made disasters and catastrophes every single day. Oh, and it's going on somewhere in the world at all times. At all times. 365. If we could have a community of like-minded people who are on the same sheet of music that have some semblance of organization, that, have, that are like-minded, out of all the things that I've seen um, bring people together. Like jujitsu brings your your people and your community yep. together, right? Preparedness is that for me. Because when when it when I see people from different sides of the aisle, liberals from San Francisco, conservatives from fucking Dallas, Texas, when they show up and they're the the idea for them is to look at trauma, first aid, whatever the fuck it is, and getting better prepared to take care of their families, they're bonded in that. And it's one of the things that I've seen bring people together for years in my company, Phil Cross Survival. And for me, American contingency is the idea that we could come together as a broader community through that means. It's not a fucking militant movement because it's a bad tactic. It is a movement to to look in your own communities, your own backyard, and come together uh, as such. Would you agree? Grab that one. I, I was going to kill it. I've been fucking kill that it. bitch. You're reading me. Would you agree? that absolutely nothing that we did in our combined careers had any like true magic to it. Meaning that it can be reduced. I mean, you come into something with uh, whatever uh, physical or emotional skills you may have as a person. And I went in with what I went, but the product or the things that we were able to do came from like the crawl, walk, run philosophy, starting with foundational steps through practice, training, practice, training, practice, training, ad nauseum. And I guess my point in saying all this is I often see people who view the special operations community as, um, fuck, like unicorns. Like, oh, no, it's just those people. And the reality is I think that's the farthest from the truth. I think that people, if they dedicate the time and energy and effort to whatever degree they want to, I'm not saying try to make yourself into a JSOC operator because if you want to do that, 
join the fucking military. And then they'll do that, but then go do some good stuff with that information. The point being, you could teach people everything that we did. There's no magic recipe that somebody's holding behind one of these curtains saying, we're not going to share this with you. You just have to go do it. When I look at, when, when I start all my technical, we, we call them, you know, gunfighter or whatever. That's a marketing tactic. Because if you call it technical skill sets or pistol 101, it won't sell as much as like, tactical. Bitch, I'm looking for pistol 115. Yeah, and they're like, <laughs> nobody show I up. I want the advanced course. Yeah, there's <laughs> no, and that's we. That's that's it right there. Is there's no fucking advanced. There's no advanced ninja school. And yeah. I always tell people in my end brief, I hate to say this, but I'm going to underwhelm you with what you're going to learn. But what I am going to do is allow you to understand technically that everything I'm teaching you is a, a developed technical rep of a skill set. Right, it's it's the mechanical process. Outside of that, you have cognitive processes and decision making that are going to allow you to navigate the world around you, executing those technical scripts. And the better you are at executing technical scripts, the more efficient you are, which means the more uh, capability you're going to have to open up your cognition to allow you to think through problem sets. That's why uh, CQB close quarters battle starts out very technical and, and it's very mundane it's it's two man it's geometry yeah it's three man into a room center fed corner fed it's it's four man it's adding problems because if you add too many problems you become overwhelmed especially if it's compounded by uh, compounded by stress well i tell people all these technical shit that you learn that never changes if you're if you're learning on a flat range how to shoot a pistol and you're doing this in a box, like this rectangle that is your hands and the pistol in front of your uh, field of view, and it's, it's a visual game of executing technical skill sets. Well, what's the difference between that on a flat range at 75 degrees, sunny, no stress, and a 747 running down the aisle trying to shoot a bad guy in the face to rescue the good guy in real life? There is no difference. The only difference the, are that guns are illegal on airplanes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you can never do that in real life. That's that's a video game. Uh, on a bus, you need that, to change that metaphor yeah, to a let's bus. Let's change it to a bus. <laughs> the only difference is the environment in which you're in. Yeah. So it, when when yeah, we look, don't develop new mechanics in that situation. Don't yeah. come up with a new tactic on no, game don't. day. Please don't. Yeah. Because because if you realize that, then you'll understand that what you're doing physically that you're emulating technically never changes. So if you think about that, like just thinking of the uh, kind of the fucking high level uh, thought strategy here, if I want to be as good as the guy running down the aisle on the 747. Or the bus. Or the bus. <laughs> let's, do, let's go with bus. You probably should go with bus. Let's go with bus. <laughs> then I, I want to imagine that I'm going to take all the technical skill sets that I execute on a flat range just as serious and then practice all the different environments, which is the advancement of executing technical scripts. So now if I'm sideways laying on my side, shooting a pistol in front of a car behind a car, or I'm in a car or I'm in my bed, getting the pistol from the nightstand, the technicalities of that remain the same. The environment has changed. So uh, you take all that, which is tech, uh, technical skill sets and the cognition that's required to, to perform or to maneuver through that environment. And then you take stress. That's really that uh, is the discriminating factor between what makes an operator uh, elite versus a person potentially good or bad. Because what I've seen is the most technically proficient people on the planet, they've gone through the Q course, they've gone through OTC, they've gone through uh, ranger training, whatever the, the training is. That is not the end all be all understanding of how that person is going to react in the most accumulative stress in the world, which is combat, which is war. So I've seen the guys who are operators or, or special operations guys in the fetal shivering, shaking. Same. Because there's, because maybe because we trained for reacting to contact to bullets, to guns, but we're getting 107 millimeter rockets shot in that have kill radiuses of 100 plus meters and nobody prepares you for that and and then that person and you can hear those fuckers coming dude this the that sound 
is horrendous. Yeah, it makes my butthole go inside out. Or like, like incoming yeah. mortar fire. Oh. Fuck, man. Dude, insane. That that's a neck that's another level. But the the point is no matter if you look at that, no matter what you do on a range, no matter what you do in training, ultimately is not going to prepare you for war like war is going to prepare you for war. That's why that's why I harp on this emulation technical script writing and they in influencer on Instagram versus somebody who maybe he's not the fastest fucking shooter, but he's been to war. He's been he's been tested, validated, and proven, and he, he's a war fighter. There's a huge fucking difference sure. between the two of those. I would actually take what well, if I look backwards. I would say because I get asked this often, people will say, "Well, how did, would a JSOC shooter stack up against?" like a three gun champion. And for 99.9% .9 of the guys, they would get the floor mopped with them. They would. But they're from a technical proficiency standpoint, so solid that you could take that shooter into the bus, the plane. They do fine on a three gun. They're not going to win, you know, against professional shooters, but take that professional shooter, take the race gun away, give them a piece of military hardware or fuck Glock 45 with regular sights and say, hey, you need to perform in all these other environments. What you're going to see is one guy who just kind of cruises and performs versus a guy who's here and then comes back down the other yeah. direction. Yeah. I'll take the guy who's at 70 percentile the entire time. Yeah, and the, and the, the technical script writer, the person who, who practices the technicalities of executing a physical movement, that has nothing to do with the script under stress. Right, so the guy who runs the gauntlet of steel and paper targets, and he smashes it, and he shows the fucking pro timer of how good he is at executing the script. Props to you for being efficient physically, and optimizing your movement, and having the fastest time. Kudos to you. Try doing that in the middle of the night in a gunfight when people are shooting real bullets at you, trying to take your fucking life. Why do you have to make fun of Terran Tactical like that? <laughs> He's a good script writer. Let's make fun of Joe Rogan. Joe, I see you at that fucking Terran tactical range, and I see you shooting really fast. Dude, I'm glad that brought you. That, why do, that hurts my feelings when I see that. <laughs> because when I see that shit, I'm like, you could see, if you look at the array of targets. Well, they never show the impacts. But yeah, they never show the but It's because every array and how it's offset, you could shoot and hit any fucking yeah, piece because, of steel. And the way that you're looking, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. The POV of the shooter, you're just literally working probably front to back, and it seems to be uh, left to right on that one side. And right. Dude, and you know the deal is a shooter just sitting there just fucking ding, 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 just letting the recoil drive you in that direction. There's no consciousness there. No. Those, du those dudes are complete. Most of them chicks, uh, and, and no offense to the chicks, but most of them are just turned off. They're unconscious, and they're just blasting. That To stay cognitive during... The hardest thing for those script writers is to... Uh, stop or interrupt the script as executed. It's the same thing. It's like the idea of doing a, a, a practical shooting exercise where you shoot the target three times and then you look left, look right, and look behind you. One, when you shoot three times, you're executing a script that if you needed to shoot five rounds, what would interrupt the cognition or the script for you to be cognitive to go, wait, three, down, three rounds didn't put them down. The likelihood of you doing that is less likely the more efficient you are. So if you continue, if you're the scriptwriter who runs around in these gauntlets and you do X Y Z, but somebody puts in and moves a target five inches to the left <laughs> and you fucking miss it, it tells me you're conscious to the script, but you're not conscious to reality. And the unfortunate thing about reality is reality maneuvers in space and time very fluidly. So it doesn't have a pattern of paper and steel arrayed in fucking micrometers, right? Yeah. And, and, and so when you take the operator who's not as, as much technically uh, script proficient, he is thinking through problem sets that are saving his life and people's lives around him and killing bad guys. That's how it works. I'm glad that those guys are out there. Uh, you know, at least they're probably learning some safe uh, weapons. Well, I'm sure they are. Safe weapons handling, manipulation. They're getting behind the gun. I love that. My only concern is confusing that type of stuff with reality. Yeah, and that's the that that to me, and being in the in tactical industry, is the biggest problem that we have, because when I, when when somebody shows up, likely they showed up because they saw me or even the scriptwriter shoot fast, and they go, Mike, I want to shoot like a gunfighter. Well, the question should be, or or the or the the comment should be, Mike, I want to perform 
or Mike, I want to think like a gunfighter. Yeah. Right. And I tell people, especially in uh, everyday carry and 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 practical uh, application, if you are drawing a pistol and shooting a bad guy in the face, you have fucked up ten times ten ten times before that actual. Uh, happened unless you got like ambushed in the parking lot. Yeah, there are the exceptions. Yeah. BJ Baldwin. Uh, I talk to BJ uh, often. He's sponsored by Monster and uh, Toyota Trucks. He's a he's a big proponent of um, everyday carry. He's always into guns and everything else. Him and his girlfriend were shot at on oh, a TV camera. I remember this. Yeah. yeah, and he fucking. I mean, dude, he's he he pinstriped that dude from chest to his face. Uh, executing the right script, but using the right process and activating the criteria for the script. And what I'm fearful of is when you see a guy who, who like I, like at that last EDC carry pistol course I did in uh, the sawmill at, in South Carolina, I said to the one of the young men, I said, you're at a gas station, you got a pistol appendix carry. You're carrying the pistol and a guy comes up to you. And the guy coming up to you is antagonizing you, he's talking shit, and he shows you the back strap of his Glock 19 in his waistband. What are you gonna do? And his answer was, um, I'm gonna draw my gun. And then when I draw my gun on him, I'm gonna stop and give him a chance. And then when, and then after I'm done giving him the chance, I might, depending on what he does, shoot him. And so I said, okay, that's good. Because the good in this is that we're talking about it. Because most people don't even, they haven't asked themselves the question, yeah. and they definitely haven't been asked the question. So I said, that's good. Talk me through this process. You pull the gun and you hold the gun on the guy and he draws the pistol. Then what are you going to do? I'll, I'll shoot him. Okay. So your criteria for killing somebody is when they go and physically move to the, the gun. That's actually good. Next question. You, what would you do? Well, if I saw the backstrap of the gun, I pull the gun and I shoot the dude in the face. Okay. Okay. That's an answer. That's a solution. Let me go, walk you through that process. You just shot a dude in the face who showed you the backstrap of a gun. What your criteria was, was seeing the gun. On camera, as a, on a CCTV camera, if it recorded that, it would look like murder. It would look like you shot him in the face and you killed him. If he lived, what's his story going to be? Hey, man, I went up and asked this guy for directions. He got hostile with me and I got scared and thought I was going to have to use my gun and I didn't do anything and he drew the pistol and he shot me and he wounded me. He and almost took my life. now I physically possess every item that he's ever owned in his life. Yeah. Now it's, now it's fucking, <laughs> yeah, that's game over. Now it's civil court. Yeah, it's civil. So now when I look at both those circumstances, the problem with how people market tactics is they make it look like it's a fucking game. The problem that we have identified in combat is it's not a game. It's a, it's a balance between life and death. Not in the game in the sense of it's comical or it's fucking entertaining. The game in the sense of one person's going to win and one person's going to fucking lose. And if you hesitate in that action or don't understand the fucking process, you're potentially going to lose. So I said to the kid who drew the pistol and he held on the guy, you're not a police officer. By law, if you pulled the gun and you brandished a firearm, that would be a criminal act. Same as the guy showing you the backstrap. Same it's as the guy brandishing. Yes, yeah, same as same as the guy showing the backstrap. And then if you decide to, uh, to shoot that guy, you've already committed the violent act before that, and likely in a civil trial or in a in a in a criminal trial of you trying to defend your life, you more likely would probably get manslaughter. You you more likely would because you look like the antagonist. You pulled the gun. You're pointing a gun in a dude's face. So it, most people would say, well, Mike, what the fuck is the right answer? Well, the right answer is there's a balance between living and operating in real-world environments and understanding your fucking criteria to go, right? I have a criteria like you have a criteria. Oh, yeah. We, what's, what's, what's unique to uh, the conversation is we know what the switch is because not only have we thought about it, but we executed it. So I know what my criteria is. So in that circumstance, if a guy is antagonizing me, I am trying to mitigate contact and risk. I'm putting the door that's in front of me between us. I'm walking around to the front of my vehicle to look for cover and concealment. I'm staging my fingers or my hands near uh, the, the bottom of my fucking flannel or plaid shirt because I'm ready to remove it to get access to my pistol. And I'm looking for behavior because if his behavior is violent, he's coming towards me, he's antagonizing me, and, and that's one thing. That doesn't mean it's the criteria to shoot him in the fucking face, which most kids who see these 
gunfighter tacticians on Instagram would think, I'll just fucking mow that dude down. Well, you go to prison for the rest of your so fucking life. So easy to say. And it's so not black and white like that. It's easy to demonstrate on a paper fucking target or yeah. a rubber dummy even. Um, this retracted gun, same same circumstance. But now I've mitigated risk. He goes for his gun. In the movement of him moving, my execution is is executing the Rolodex that I have in the back of my head and picking out the script of an efficient draw from appendix carry and shooting him in the chest and the face until he goes down and he's no longer a threat. That's that's the technical script that I'm that I've written, but that's also tied to the cognition that I'm thinking through. Yeah. So it's not like three rounds checking out, gun down, looking down, left, right, and rear. It's fucking it's thinking and technically scripting. Uh, the execution of it. If you go to any everyday carry conceal carry course, you go to it yourself. The conversations that you have at a fucking dinner table could be more advantageous than that actual course. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, nobody asks the, the fucking question. Yeah, I mean, what, let's a, let's ask you a, just for fucking the entertainment because because you've been in these circumstances. What is the criteria for you to literally lift your shirt? pull the pistol out of your waistband and out of your holster and present the gun and go to work. What What is that? So for me, I'm not going to present unless I'm going to use it because I'm not going to brandish. For So if I go, I'm going to go. And for me, the line in the sand is probably deeper or closer to me because I'm comfortable in my reaction. Like that same scenario you're talking about, I was already thinking through it in my head. You can always manage, you know, space and distance usually. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at posture. I'm looking, is this dude drunk? You know what I mean? Is he antagonistic drunk? Did he mean, you know what I mean? Did he mean yeah. to brandish? Yeah. I, I've seen people brandish uh, accidentally, but guess what was right next to that uh, fucking pistol grip? It was a badge. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't necessarily, there's a lot of shit you got to take into play. Time of day. Another thing I'd be looking at is, hey, is there another motherfucker with this dude? Am I getting yeah. maneuvered on while this guy's looking at me? I would do exactly the same thing. And I would be comfortable in my reaction that my my line in the sand is an aggressive movement with the intent for that individual to do harm or to take my life and once that is met i'm going to go and i'm yeah. going to go until the threat is no longer a threat that's a, the greatest thing you said in that is um in assessing the environmental factors or we'll call this just the behavioral factors you you are determining what your actions are going to be based on their actions yeah and and people forget that because a deliberate hit looks very different than a drunk bum looking for money. It's Well, a deliberate hit is not going to look like that yeah. at all. Yeah. Tactically, th- th- behaviorally, there's there's all these signs and indications. And my, my favorite thing you said also is too is creating, like you have the ability in your own shoes and your own feet to create distance and space. Yep. Just back to the point of what you said about the protesters with a gun and the body armor. You are disadvantagedly mismanaging the tactic because you are not allowing yourself to break contact and you are creating the the circumstance to only meet those confrontations head on and that's a bad tactic yeah that's that's like walking out in the middle of the street in baghdad and getting out of your up armored vehicle walking down the middle of the road kicking cans that are filled with ieds <laughs> and saying fuck it I'm, I'm taking the chances here like that don't do that don't be that fucking guy yeah, those situations are hard to, uh, they're not hard to talk through. I t- take that back. It's the exact opposite. I think for you and I, they're very easy to talk our way through. Like we could go situation after situation. And the problem, I think, is that people think they're far easier to deal with than they are in reality. Mm. The decision to take another person's life should not be something that you are uh, braggadocious about or shouldn't be driven in bravado or. I mean, fuck, we probably both know people that want that scenario to play itself out mm-hmm. in, in the gas station, and I don't want to. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'd rather I'd rather give some fuckwit a pass and give him another day and look on camera like, oh, well, you were just a pussy. I'm like, no, I just basically walked away. Yeah. I managed my distance and walked away, and we both lived, and there was no police report and none of this shit. Like, I'd rather do that than be wrong. Well, why is... Uh, I, I've noticed that in myself as I've gotten older. Yeah. But also, like, if I was a team guy... And I, like when I was on active duty, dude, I was looking for fights everywhere. For sure. And I was, I remember being at gas stations, going to the shitty gas stations because I'm like, I wish a motherfucker would. <laughs> you know, like I'm like, I yes. think it's, uh, I, in my experience, it's been the more exposure to violence, the least likely you are to actually seek it out. Yes. Because, and also when it comes to fighting, I mean, 
If you think you're going to be a badass in a fight, what I recommend people do is go do two months of jujitsu and you'll realize you actually don't want to put hands on people because these nerd assassin motherfuckers who wear Harry Potter spectacles and fucking crunch numbers all day long will bow tie your shit and you realize it's just not worth it because you never, you and I are very, I mean, nobody knows who I am in this town, which is awesome. I don't have fucking uh, a Punisher skull on the back of my truck with a veteran license plate and a fucking purple heart. And I have two of those. Three. Don't tread on me. Of course. Well, I'm just <laughs> no, describing I'm your vehicle as I saw it earlier today. <laughs> I don't have any of that shit. That's I good. don't wear military shirts. Yeah. I don't wear camo out in town. Spoiler alert. Gay. Yeah, but it is. Yeah. And I don't mean gay as in happy. I mean gay as in sucking another man's dick. Which I don't know if I can Ooh, say yeah. that on a podcast, but that's a good one. I, I thought you were going to go the opposite there. I like that. I like your your no, truth. One dude and another dude, and it's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying it's gay. Um, <laughs> I don't wear camo out in town. I don't wear like veteran T-shirts. I don't wear. I don't have a hat that says Operation Enduring Freedom Veteran. With, you should. That'd be badass. God, I run away from those people. <laughs> I just want to be left alone. I don't want to be involved in violence because I've seen it. I've been on the receiving end. I've been on the action end of it. And it all hurts. It does. To a degree. Yeah. In the short term or the long term. And I don't want any part of it, man. Yeah. I just want to be left to fuck alone. I think I have a lot of empathy for people now more as well. Like when I see these, even these dumbass Antifa dudes, I'm like, dude, you guys need a fucking job. How about this one? Is silence violence, Mike? Oh my fucking God. <laughs> Surreptitious silence. Holy fuck. That's, is that a thing now? No, they will scream people down. Your silence is violence. And again, I was talking with Bishop. And I, we need a different bumper sticker that says violence is violence and silence is silence. That's true. It's that, fucking rid ridiculous. It's, well, not, it's, yeah. it's the redefining of, of words. Like words used to mean something. And now it's like you could create any accumulation of fucking words and, and change the world because it's just defined by you and the fucking cronies that, that work or live with you or buy into your bullshit. Just as somebody who's been around what's called an average amount of violence in their life, it doesn't feel to me like silence. Yeah. You not know, at all. Not they, even close. Yeah. But one's an incredible talking point that they'll sit there and like, you know, yell at you. And it's just like, again, context. Let's get some more context. Let's get some more laps around the sun. Let's get some more experience outside of an insulated bubble where you're surrounded by opportunity, which maybe that makes people too soft. I think that's a part of it. I I don't like when I see all those circumstances unfolding where people are getting bullied. Like the you see the one where they're in the restaurant. There's one in the subway where they're telling them to raise their fist. And they oh, won't they're raise like their pinned fist. in. Yeah, yeah, they're pinning them. I I just can't fathom one of us being in that circumstance. Right? I can't fathom doing that to another human being. To either. me, that seems like if I was to try to think of a way, an effective way to make sure that nobody would ever even truly consider my idea or philosophy, That's the way. that is how I would make sure that it is never even considered. Yeah, That'd be like the number, okay, how, what's, the, what's the least effective way I can uh, behave to spread my message? It would look exactly like that. Yeah, I want people to, see, I want people to hate me and I, I also want people to realize that I'm tyrannical. I'm the dictator or oppressive dictator. And and it fits, like when I see that, when they talk about fascism and Nazi Germany, I see that and I go, that's fucking the Waffen SS. Yeah. I mean, they're fucking bully tactics. Or like the girl following some of the couples out of the GOP convention and they're, they're walking with the cell phones and she's like, I'm gonna kill your wife. How do you feel about that? I'm gonna fucking kill your wife. As they're walking. I can't imagine walking with my spouse and somebody saying, I'm gonna kill your fucking loved one. That's not gonna go well. Dude, that would not, oh, that would not go. But the problem, here's, all that said, the problem that I see that actually, like that is stupid, right? I, I look at that shit and I go, that's comical. That's just dumb shit. But the problem that I see is when you have people who are politicians in positions of uh, literal power, like meaning uh, the district attorneys yeah. that are changing uh, use of force policies across our nation, that's fucking scary. Because if I defend my life in that circumstance, if you have somebody in anywhere on any given day, if they come up to you and put their finger in your face and they say, I'm gonna fucking kill you, that's a crime. You, you can't, you can't one, you, you can't uh, tell somebody you're going to fucking kill them because you can't v verbalize a, a, it's assault. Yeah. You can't say that. That would be like saying, I have a gun. Well, you just told everybody you have a gun. 
call in 911, you're probably going to get rolled the you fuck up. You can't say bomb on an airplane, Bob. Bob, 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 You can't fucking say that. <laughs> so that, with that being said, if it's not enforced and there's no ramifications and there's only pandering and facilitation, then what does that look like for us on the other end that are just law abiding? Because if I'm in that circumstance, I'm grabbing that woman by her fucking face. You almost used a different word. I know. Almost, I was so fucking You almost close. used a different word. I, almost I think did. it started with a B. No, no, no. Something else. <laughs> start with a C? No, something That's a else. powerful one. <laughs> I, would, I would take that fucking chi- That chick. It was chick. Let's start with a C. It was, I would take that fucking chick and I would smash her fucking, I would grab her by her face and I would shove her off the fucking sidewalk that I was on and, and project violence. So everybody around who thought that they were going to violently do anything, now it's like, you know, dogs smelling each other's asses. I was going to, I would let everybody know that I'm the fucking alpha in that circumstance. And then I would posture myself to be able to defend my life because the, the chance of that going bad are high because now it's it's it what it's turning into is I'm gonna push you because you got an AR-15 then I'm gonna push you to the fucking ground then I'm gonna take a skateboard and hit you in the fucking head then I'm gonna take a fucking pistol and pretend like we're cool and then try to shoot you in the face and Kyle Rittenhouse experienced all fucking four of those yeah and which, all those are compounded yeah. when you are uh the minority meaning numbers wise in a vastly superior yeah mob mentality oh fuck man dude that those mobs that Kyle Rittenhouse shit bumps me the fuck out because it really does. He's man. a kid, I'm the same boy, the same way. Uh, I'm like, fuck. Dude. If that was my son, that would bum me the fuck out because now, uh, like, the likelihood of him going to prison for murder is unlikely. But the likelihood of him going, yeah, I don't think there was premeditation, so they're gonna have yeah. a tough one with that. But manslaughter, manslaughter, is possible. Is reckless, reckless homicide. Yeah, it could be a charge. I think that's a minimum of five years in prison. That dude for for a seventeen year old kid who thought he was doing the right thing, yeah. Um, which you can't argue that the Antifa people think they're doing the fucking right thing. Throwing bricks at people's faces, hitting people in the head with skateboards—that's never the right thing. But defending, standing there with an AR fifteen, defending a business, at, as all accounts line out in videos that he was doing it for the right reasons. Uh, even he the day before he was scrubbing graffiti off a fucking wall. Yeah, I mean it's unfortunate that whole fucking thing took place. It's unfortunate that those guys lost their lives over something so I agree. fucking dumb. I agree, and I actually think that his uh, his mom, if she took him there, knowing what he was up to, should share in that prison sentence. I, I think so too. I think unfortunately because she's I a do. fucking adult. Yeah, you that, know he's a he's a minor. He's a fucking child. Yeah, I mean I was in the army when I was seventeen, but nobody gave a fuck. I was too, but you know because that argument will come up. But we were also trained. And supervised, yeah, and we were never at yeah. a point where we were running around by ourselves. Yeah. Was in the w- barracks. That's a, well, even, even you were part of a of a unit, mm-hmm. working together as a team. It was a very different environment. When you know, yes, people who are eighteen or seventeen and a half, whatever it may be, can join the military and get that training, but they're not like sent off into the woods by themselves. Yeah, it's true. You know, it's it's a completely controlled environment. And what you have almost at all times, especially if you're that young, is very senior people with severe oversight over you. Because guess what? That shit's dangerous. Yeah. Fuck. True. <laughs> if if there was a recall right now, would you go? Yes. Wow. Oh, no hesitation. <laughs> would you go back as an O three? It would depend on the job they were offering me. If mm. it was a shooter or flying a desk, I'd be like, here's my commission. No. <laughs> <laughs> You could take that commission. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I'll ever lose the willingness to do that. I think I'm timed out, you know, currency wise and tact. I mean, the gear has moved on, and I'm sure the tactics are relatively the same. But I mean, how, how fuck? How could I not? Yeah. How could I pass? If they came to me and said, "Hey, we need you to come," who the fuck would I be if I said, "No, go find somebody else"? Yeah. I have to. Mm-hmm. I believe that you have to be in a value add, a responsible, accountable member of society. And I'd already dedicated my life to that earlier on. And the philosophies that I had when I went in there have only been strengthened. Mm-hmm. The uh, the love that I have for this country, regardless if I believe in somebody's opinion or not, I'll still listen to them. Like, it's only been strengthened. What's, your, what's, what's that purpose or what's that uh, service now? What are you doing? To, to I think we're doing it right now. I, I think... think so. Well, I don't know. I don't. <sighs> we talked about mushrooms, weed. <laughs> well, it, I think it's the fact that we can sit down and have a longer conversation from an interesting experience that a lot of people don't have. And I and I and I say that I think it's meaningful because I get hundreds of messages from people saying, "Hey, this was meaningful to me." 
Um, I mean, from a tactical perspective, you and I, everybody has an ex- expiration date. You'll time out. But the ability to pass on that knowledge to talk about things like leadership and integrity and accountability and responsibility and how to apply those things, the what ifs, the scenarios that we're talking about, I think it has incredible value. I think we're doing that now. That affects uh, thousands of people. I think it does. Yeah, it does. Uh, um, probably less so you and I, because we're talking about things. We came up, though, in such a bizarre and unique path. I mean, if you really think about it from just a math perspective, our optic in our context is very, it's skewed. And that's like, I it was thinking about, fuck, Tim, you're right. Like, I don't think about the bias I have or the inherent distrust, but it comes from engagements with human beings that just, you know, seeing the worst sides of humanity. There's no way I can turn that off. And I do view everybody that way, but don't worry. I view everybody that way. Yeah. Equally across the board, man or woman, I inherently hate you until mm. you prove otherwise. <laughs> yeah, in the same way, man. What do you, what do you find it, what do you find in passion in now? Is it jujitsu? It seems like you picked up the gi and you, you're I back love into ju- it. Well, I love jujitsu for a couple aspects. One, it's a never ending learning process, right? So how can you not for me personally, I love those things. How can you not fall in love with something where the end state moves along with you? Mm-hmm. Like you'll never master it. So I love that. But also there is a crazy element of psychological and physiological readiness in there as well. Having, I mean, it's not jujitsu. I, I say this as a concept. It's not hard, but being very good at it or proficient in it is very hard. It's, it's weight and leverage and angles and an, you know, that's really easy to say those three things and you're going to get smashed for years on the mat because you have to learn those things incrementally. The concepts of shooting, not that hard, right? Mm-hmm. Stance, how do you hold a gun, side alignment, manage and control your trigger. Easy to say. We could go out to a range right now and people would be shooting into the ground in front of them. Yeah. It would be like, yeah. you know, a shotgun pattern because it's easy to say it's hard to do. But I love jujitsu because it keeps my mind sharp and I do view it from the perspective of self-defense. And you need to hear this, people, not self-offense. I don't want to get in a fight. Yeah. I don't fucking want to get in a fight. Yeah. But if you force me to that place, I'm going to be as capable and competent as humanly possible. And if you force me into that place where there's weapons involved, you need to stand the fuck by because I'm still training on those things as well. So I think the most uh, rewarding thing that I do at this point, one would be going and talking to organizations and people about leadership. But that's off the table right now. So yeah. that would be probably the thing I'm the most passionate about. But I think we're touching more people now Yeah, doing this. Yeah, it seems like an, uh, uh, it always has seemed that way in the last few years since I started my podcast that it's becoming a thing, right? Yeah. Um, podcasting, you know, long form versions of it are, uh, you know, you're that quiet, you're that third person in the room yeah. able to digest all that information. Um, are you gi or no gi? I do both. You do both, okay. Um, most of the cla- – well, the classes that we take are uh, wearing a gi, but definitely an open mat. I'll pop the gi top on and off. And I think a lot – I was actually with a conversation with uh, Rogan about this because I was asking him. He came up um, – I know he got his black belt from one of the Machadas, and I, and I it might have been Jean Jacques, but he got also a black belt from uh, Eddie Bravo, which is specifically no gi. And I think he did more of that than gi rolling. So I asked him how – he approaches rolling with a gi and the thing with a gi like there's door handles you're just like yeah yeah which is not there except for in montana like your flannel would is pretty much a gi i could choke you to death with a gi or any great gi yeah it's it is even t-shirts if unless the seams don't rip you can get choked to death with a goddamn beefy t hanes Mm -hmm. but in montana sweatshirts jackets it's pretty common but talking to joe he's like when i roll with the gi I just don't take those grips. So that way what he is doing is not reliant upon clothing. Ooh. And I like that, right? He's why adaptable. why rely yeah. on a single point of failure? I yeah. mean, that's that's like a day one shit for us. I don't want to have a tactic that only works. It's like, hey, here's a great tactic, asterisk, if they're wearing a jacket. Mm. What about That's just if, the benefit. Yeah, what if we're at the beach? You know, mm-hmm. like and we got no jacket, no shirts, and we're wearing shorts. It has to work there. So yeah. I always approach jujitsu from a perspective of – being able to handle myself, and the thing is, like, the more I learn about it, the least, the less likely I am. I don't want to go and do that shit in a bar. I don't want to hurt anybody because you learn about it. And you're like, okay, it's it's, it's kind of not even fair. Yeah, oh yeah. When you encounter when people you encounter somebody who doesn't oh, know God. anything, but they think they're a badass. Yeah. it's so easy. It is easy, and yeah. you know what though? The easier thing is fucking walk away. Yeah, buy him a beer and walk away. Yeah. Are you? Um, is your body holding up? Yeah, very well actually. Really? Yeah. So I But I'm in fucking indestructible. There's never been somebody built like me. Yeah, that's I true. Have, <laughs> gangly and tall, <laughs> lanky. Yeah, no, it's 
I got my I got miles on the old uh, f- meat vehicle that I walk around. Yeah, your your back's good. Yeah, knees, backs, knees. Uh, I jacked up my elbow a, a couple of weeks ago, which was my fault. Yeah, and I what I do is I listen to my body. Though I'm not 20 anymore. I turn 43 next month, and I. I don't need to remind myself of that because I wake up every morning and I feel that. Yeah, I feel it too, man. <laughs> so I take it yeah. easy and I, I was really lucky to find a school where the mat culture is awesome. It's not a bunch of 20 year old dudes tatted up and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying to people who, if you go to look for a jujitsu school and it's all beefed out dudes in their early twenties, smashing each other. And you're a little bit later on in your uh, revolutions around the sun, just realize they're going to treat you like uh, a piranha tank. Yeah. So find a place that has a more balanced mat. The culture is, it's awesome. You have death matches for sure, but for the most, it's very chill. And it, you know, you, I mean, I will escalate if people escalate, but I just try to start at a very chill level. Yeah, my neck, I got a, a compressed disc in C3 and 4. Yeah. And uh, at the base of my spine. And so... Like last time I was rolling, I was rolling with uh, Chad Robichaud, and Chad's a he's a former um, a champion fighter. Um, he's also a, a, a I can't remember what degree black belt in Brazilian jiu- 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 jitsu. Uh, he's a Gracie guy, and he dropped me like Powell drove me on my fucking neck, and instantly I felt that nerve kink yeah. out and just blow my neck out, and I was fucking just I was like, man, am I ever going to get back? And I wondered if it was a conditioning thing. Besides him planting 240 pounds of my ass on my neck, which he shouldn't have done, by the way. Yeah, yeah, and he he, <laughs> he the way he he the way he was moving me, it just set me up for that way. Yeah, and the last, I mean, I blew my hamstring off of my fucking bone in jujitsu in a bad fucking uh, training up for the modern army's combative shit. Yeah, and um, I just it, I feel like that probably didn't, that probably didn't hurt at all. I feel like, dude, <laughs> that was the that's the most painful injury I've ever had. It's the cramp that never went away. Oh. It's like, oh, shit, I got a cramp. And you're like, I'm like, oh, God. And then that feeling of, oh, fuck, never went away. And I was like, oh, what what the fuck's going on? And then just in constant pain and then (laughs) surgery, more pain, and then it it fucking finally went away. Yeah. No, I I try to remember how old I am. I want to have as many usable years as possible. But I think pursuits like that will actually extend usable years. I I, want to get back in it, man. Yeah. I see you doing this. I see you, you, you guys are motivating me because I see... Rogan's old ass, you you doing it? Rogan's like, old as fuck. He, I know, seventy four. I think he just turned. Yeah, I can't believe. I'm surprised he moved to Austin. I'm I surprised. don't know much about Austin. I'm not surprised he moved to Texas. I don't know much about the individual I don't cities. Like Austin's not. I, I like Austin. Austin's got good beer, uh, good chow, but Austin is like Cali- uh, Like maybe that's the reason why it's like California. Maybe yeah, but it's just fucking. I don't know, man. It's just uh, Texas. I'm not a fucking. It's too fucking hot there. In Austin, the summer months, you will die, dude. I was in Dallas Fort Worth and it was 106 degrees on the range. We had we had people passing out in the fucking class. I was like, this is not good. That's kind of awesome though. My insurance is gonna fucking <laughs> wanna shit can shit can me. I can't fucking do it. Fuck. What do you want to end with, dude? Yeah, we've been at it for three and a half hours again. Really? Yeah. That's solid. <laughs> I always know a good podcast when I don't feel like it's it's not it's at all. Honest. I just I'm measuring the time by my my bladder. Yeah, you about ready to have to pee? Oh, I'm I'm gonna pee in a bottle underneath the table. Sweet. Me I did too. that twice already. What should we close with? We covered quite Ooh. the spectrum. Fuck. There was a lot of shit in that one. How about this? Be a fucking responsible American. Be kind to your uh, your neighbor, regardless of the beliefs that they may have, because we're still all in this together. That's a good way to end it. I, I, I share that sentiment because I think we're all worked up because of COVID. And we, all, we are over emotional and dramatic about fucking everything. That's the culture we currently live in where everybody's fucking sensitive because uh, this politically divisive culture. Outside of politics, outside of what team you're on, what football team you like, the BLM movement, we're just fucking Americans trying to get through the fucking day. Um, you you had mentioned it, and I reposted your post on uh, social media on September 11th. That uh, upset a few people, but also set the internet ablaze. It did. I thought it was a g- great post. That's why I shared it exactly verbatim. I don't even add words to that because it shares everything that I was going to say as well. And w- the feeling we had September 12th, that world, I miss that world. Same. I miss that nation. And uh, we can get back to that nation. We just need to fucking remember at the end of the day, like there's people dying in wildfire. People, Americans dying in fires in this country should not be happening. Um, 
people getting hit in the head with skateboards and fucking any place in this country should not be happening. And I think we just need to fucking chill, take a chill pill. Watch Yellowstone on Netflix. That will at Hell least give yeah. you three days of sitting on your ass. We need that, man. Hell yeah. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me on.